Uh, we will reconvene our meeting. We just exited an executive <coughs> session where, for the purpose of discussing collective bargaining with the teachers and also with the superintendent of schools. Although his isn't collective bargaining, his is single person Individual, bargaining. Yes. There's no collective, right, John? <coughs> That's correct. You. Okay. So before we get into uh, the public budget hearing, uh, first order of business, as always, is public input. If there's anybody here who would like to be heard on any items not on the agenda, please make yourself known. Okay, seeing no one at this time, we'll move to the student report, and tonight we have Michael <coughs> Terrell. Michael? Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, this period of the year is really best described as a transition period. Spring sports teams are having their first games, although the weather is more apt for winter sports. Uh, boys tennis played Maskinomit today. Uh, here, well, the girls played Maskinomit away. Softball also played Maskinomit in their respective sport. Tomorrow, baseball is vying against Linfield, boys lacrosse against Pentucket, and girls tennis Saugus. Later this week, uh, boys and girls tennis, track, softball, and baseball, and lacrosse all have more games. In addition to the transition in sports, there has been a number of academic transitions. Third quarter ended last week uh, after being extended due to a number of snow days. Uh, a accepted students' days are taking place uh, throughout all colleges, uh, which is the reason I had to rush here on such short notice to replace uh, Gerlin. Uh, scholarship applications are also being submitted. However, there are still a number of scholarships uh, in the guidance office that still need to be applied to or are still open. SLAM applications, student leadership and mentoring in the high school level, their applications are due in the coming weeks, and National Honor Society applications were finalized last week. The induction ceremony for National Honor Society is May 10th. Uh, final prep for the AP exams, and as a member of a few AP classes, you know, it, it's very hectic this time of year for those classes. It's taking place for these exams, which take place in mid-May. AP meetings for AP classes next year uh, that students are interested in enrolling in have been taking place recently, the past week, and will be continuing the next week. Uh, students have been signing up for taking and receiving scores from the SAT and ACT tests. Uh, additionally, community service hours are due in a few short, and they definitely feel very short, uh, weeks. However, uh, during this transition and somewhat mundane time, a number of noteworthy events have gone on with, with great success. Uh, high level, higher level Spanish classes uh, watched a show and ate lunch last Tuesday on a field trip, and last Friday's uh, we had seniors Zoe Kennedy and Caitlin Galvin, who's also a representative here, travel to the State House representing Brad Jones in the Student Government Day. Uh, they voted to raise the age of tobacco to t a purchase to 21, but against recommending the abolition of the Electoral College, <coughs> which is just some interesting facts there. The College Fair, when junior students can meet representatives of potential colleges, is taking place this Wednesday, courtesy of Guidance, and they always do such a great job with applications and uh, college uh, items. On April 27th, Stuco is hosting its second uh, Kids Night Out, that being Student Council, where the town's parents and teachers can enjoy a night free of kids by dropping off their children at the high school uh, for Student Council to take care of. Also in Student Council, Mary Madden is running to be our Northeastern Massachusetts Association of Student Council's president. Uh, we've had a number of success on these boards. We've had Dan Madden <coughs> two years ago, who was our state president. Last year, we had Duncan McNeil, who was our co-vice president at the regional level, and now Mary hopefully enjoy that same success. Uh, the track team's mattress sale uh, was successful. They have one every year. This year they raised $6,700 for uh, their athletics. In addition, we have the honorary dinner for students on May 10th. Uh, this is coming up later, but it is the top five students in the senior class have a, a dinner courtesy of the North Reading Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in the arts, the All Town Chorus uh, had uh, it's event last Wednesday, and the All-Town Band is, uh, is performing tomorrow. Both of these events take place in high school. Again, the Performing Arts Center uh, allows these great competitions. The previous years, uh, when I was a member of chorus and band, we had it all squeezed together in either the Batch Gym or the old mm -hmm. high school gym, and it was always a squeeze. Now, the space is, is amazing. We can fit so many people there. So again, yeah. uh, the facilities are amazing. And then three really noteworthy things that have happened in the past week. The first is we had a speaker uh, for junior and seniors uh, named Kara Filler. She came in to speak to us junior and seniors on the dangers of 
speeding, and other types of dangerous driving. She's from Canada, and her speech was, was very moving, very sobering. I, it, was a, it was a very, very excellent presentation. So again, thank you for the Parents Association for hosting such amazing presentations, always. Uh, last Saturday, we had Parent University, which was uh, a flying success. I presented a workshop there. Um, the workshops were all very well done. They were great. Uh, Great, great presenters from what I heard from other people in the workshops, and we had a number of enrollees. I think uh, Superintendent Bernard may speak more on that later. And finally, uh, the most exciting one would be prom. Junior prom took place this Friday at the Hillview. Uh, it's always a success. Uh, the junior class officers did a great job. The administrators helped plan an excellent night, and so did the teachers advising those students. So this, I mean, this time is a transition period, but still, there's been a number, a number of great, great activities. We had some great spring weather for the uh, junior prom, too, wasn't it? Exactly. It's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Couldn't have been better. I mean, the snow was perfect. Exactly. Also, a piece <laughs> of student work, uh, in case you want to pass around. So this student work is from my AP English class. We were tasked with creating a prompt that the College Board would be able to hand out hypothetically. Um, it's called the synthesis prompt, so we had to provide a number of pieces of evidence that students would <coughs> use to respond to a prompt. So I'll just pass that around with a rubric. Okay. Any questions for Michael tonight? Any age limit to dropping off your children to the, to the student council there? It's a very good question. I, we do all ages, actually. All ages. So, <laughs> all right. uh, you know, there's get to a point where, you know, once you get old enough, uh, you know, it could be a little bit interesting right. there. I'm just curious. I heard your wife wanted to drop you off. That's what I thought. <laughs> but. Um, did you present at, I, I was at the parent university, but I didn't make your. Um, so I presented a workshop. I don't know the exact name. Great, right? Great presenter. Yeah. Uh, social media and teenagers. So I spoke to a, a number of parents about how social media, um, how teens use social media, what new types of social media are impacting teens, and how they as parents can uh, encourage responsible use in their houses. From everything I heard, Parent University was a, was a great success. So uh, hats off to you very and the pleased. administration and the I think a little bit out of volunteers. Players, it was, yeah, we're very pleased. Michael did a great, his, his workshop was very popular three times. Wow. So. Anything else for Michael? All right. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. John, at this point, uh, do you mind if we, would you suggest we move to the public hearing? Public hearing? Yeah. To make a motion to open the public yeah. hearing. Yeah. So at this time, I'll entertain a motion to open the public budget hearing. Motion by Janine, second by Scott. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any questions? Unanimous. <laughs> so uh, before Mr. Conley makes his presentation here, just a, just a few words. Uh, what we're presenting tonight is essentially the same budget we presented at our preliminary hearing. Mm -hmm. We've got some fairly good news from the town, but we're still a fair amount away from where we need to be to meet this budget. So tonight we're going to present the budget we recommend and that we want. On the 30th, we'll vote for the budget that we have the funds to cover. Um, our hope is that between now and the 30th, more money frees up from the town or the state. There's been some movement at the state yep. on some special education circuit breaker money that would help us. And uh, there's also been some movement at the state, although we don't know if this will occur to raise the increase in Chapter 70 per student to $100 per student versus current $20, correct, Michael? Correct. Which would be a huge increase. The, the issue with most state-related things is we won't find out until probably June 30th whether or not we have that, we'll get that money, because that's when the state budget is normally approved. Sometimes it even goes into July, and they pass an emergency spending bill until they get their budget done for the fiscal year. So tonight, you're going to pretty much see the same budget. It's, it's in our opinion, a lean budget. It includes 3.9 new positions. Yep. And it's really a modified level services budget, except for these 3.9 yep. positions. Correct. So I'll turn it over to Michael now. Thank you, Chairman Webster. So um, there's also copies of the PowerPoint slide up front on both sides of the distance learning lab for those that want to follow along the slides. Um, but essentially tonight, I'm going to go over um, about 10 PowerPoint slides that provide a, an overview of our FY19 budget. We've certainly published and presented a lot of information at a, in a, on a variety of platforms over the last few weeks. So what we hope to do tonight is hit kind of the, the high points of the FY19 budget, talk about some of the main budget drivers that are 
driving the development of the fiscal 2019 budget. As Chairman Webster just talked about, going through a little bit more detail about those new positions, those 3.9 FTE, new positions driven by our strategic plan. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about revenue offsets and budget subsidies and some of the other sources that help make the everything work here in North Reading, help to fund the educational experience, um, what it is for the North Reading students. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the current budget. So as Chairman Webster said, just for over the past week to 10 days, we've had some great news <coughs> with the Board of Selectmen and members of the town and that budget gap that I presented at the preliminary budget presentation on March 12th has been considerably reduced. So we'll talk a little bit about that gap and where it stands today and some of the, the work that remains to do to, to fully fund our, our recommended budget. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about next steps. And at that point, I'll you know, open up the floor to the school committee for any you know, discussion and questions and, of course, members of the community um, as well. So we've had five major budget drivers in fiscal 2019. Um, so our recommended budget request was a 5.3% increase over fiscal year 2018. Um, so these percentages here represented here over on the, um, in this column, far right column, is essentially represents what the level of increase that these budget drivers represent. So it, they, they're pretty, close to tie out to the 5.3% increase that is that we are requesting in our recommended budget. So you can kind of see what are the major budget drivers and how, to, how they compare. Um, but it's not uncommon that our contractual, contractual salary obligations represent a 2.6% <coughs> increase. Salaries in a school budget typically rep represent over 80% of a, a budget. That's pretty common stat in school budgets. And in this, in this budget, it's 82.6% of our total budget is from salaries. Um, this includes the modest cost of living adjustments as well as costs for step increases, lane movements, in some cases longevity increases for all eligible staff. And as I said, it's about a 2.6% increase so to, to fund these, these contractual salary obligations. The year three of NRPS 2021, um, those are actually the 3.9 FTE of new positions. NRPS 2021 is our strategic plan. The district has a five-year educational strategic plan. And FY19, next year's budget, would represent year three of that plan. So the administration has proposed to the school committee uh, 3.9 FTE of we feel like real high priority key positions to help enhance our educational program for next year. So I'll talk a little bit more about these positions, but in total, it was a relatively modest request that only added about 0.85% to our total budget request. The next uh, driver is operational costs. Um, so these, this is always kind of a driver of the school budget. Um, the district has many fixed costs, um, increases that in some cases have presented uh, you know, a budgetary challenge um, the last couple of years, and this really is we certainly have seen a need to adjust our building maintenance line items, um, in some cases to keep pace with rate increases or just actual expenditures um, over the last couple of years. These are in the following areas like HVAC, heating and cooling needs, plumbing maintenance needs, boiler and service uh, maintenance needs, in some cases you know, landscaping needs across our four school campuses. Uh, we operate a wastewater treatment plant and facility. Those rates and those needs are going up on an annual basis, so we've had to adjust line items in that area. Um, we certainly uh, help fund our snow and ice removal of our school you know, parking lots and, and sidewalks and roads, so we've certainly had to adjust to the most current trends for snow and ice removal. Um, this area also funds our utility costs for electricity and water and gas. These rates tend to go up every year, so we've had to make adjustments there in fiscal 2019. Uh, we work very hard to control these operational costs. We work with our you know, you know, directors and um, we work to see to control our utility costs. Um, and we've worked hard to keep this increase minimal on an annual basis. And that's these costs, although they're increasing, is only accounting for a modest 0.3% of our, again, our to that total 5.3% recommended increase. The next driver, um, certainly a big part of the, the story when we're uh, funding, um, recommending the FY 2019 budget 
is our special education out of district costs. Um, so funds needed to support anticipated out of district tuitions certainly are expected to increase in fiscal year 2019. So the district actually anticipates a slight decrease in the number of students that it will be outplaced in out of district placements in fiscal 2019. Um, from about 36 students currently to a projected 35 students next year. Um, however, despite antici anticipating having less students in out of district placements in fiscal 2019, the costs are rising given several changes in placements of students to more appropriately meet their needs. Um, and as well as what Chairman Webster alluded to in the opening, we are also currently, uh, when we prepared the recommended budget, we're anticipating a loss in the special education circuit breaker program. The district receives a level of uh, reimbursement based on eligible costs over a specific threshold. That is always a, a large revenue offset uh, to the budget. And in fiscal year 2018, the current fiscal year that we are in, the state didn't fully fund that reimbursement program. And in most cases, that has an effect <coughs> on the subsequent year. So we've had to make an adjustment in that fiscal year 2019 offset. So in a lot of ways, that's sort of a double impact of why this increase is looking at um, so, you know, so large next year, about 1.3%. So certainly a major driver and a major part of the, the story in developing our fiscal 2019 budget. Uh, a little bit later on, though, I will talk about some changes and some positive news that we've heard from the state level and the potential that that um, reimbursement rate will be restored to more uh, higher levels and there's a chance that um, we could recommend as we move through the budget process an adjustment to this offset which would free up some additional revenue and help shorten that budget gap which I'll get to a little bit later so there's some positive news on that on that uh, you know offset that we've talked about but certainly it's been a challenge in fiscal 2019 this last item um, uh, restoration of school expense budgets and small capital needs um, unfortunately, we've had to either reduce or level fund the school expense uh, you know, budgets at all the schools and all the departments. When I say that school expense budgets, that's really the discretionary spending by the school principals to help fund instructional materials, textbooks, technology items that go directly into the classroom. So we certainly try to ensure that you know, every school has what they need and so forth, forth the curriculum materials needed. Um, but unfortunately, we've had to sort of level fund over a period of years. And with inflation and increases, you know, th these costs go up every year. It's been more and more of a challenge by all the school principals in the school district to, to bring all these needed supplies and materials you know, into the classroom. We certainly have made it work. In a lot of cases, by the generous donations of our parent uh, associations and, and PTO groups, but we certainly feel a need and it's been a priority um, as well as a school committee budget goal to restore some of these line items to increase kind of the per pupil spending to help ensure that the classrooms and the, the, and the, the schools and the departments have the appropriate um, line items and, and funding level for materials, textbooks, and technology. Um, we've also had to reduce and eliminate, essentially eliminate our small capital and equipment needs. So we like to hold a small amount, you know, in the range of you know, ten to fifteen thousand dollars, small line item in the budget, to help uh, fund small capital needs that don't qualify for large capital expenses that kind of flow through the town's capital improvement planning committee process, where the town looks at all town and school departments' large capital needs and it's funded through a committee that reviews view, reviews those requests and makes recommendations to the board of selectmen. Is items that are cost less than $25,000 um, that still need to be uh, addressed. These could be things like, you know, fence repairs, you know, carpet replacements, cleaning equipment replacements, school furniture replacement needs um, that we need some funding for. So there's an attempt to restore some of these line items, in some cases to prior year levels, but it's a very small adjustment, only accounting for a 0.2% increase in our total recommended request, which was, again, a 5.3% increase over fiscal year 2018. So this is essentially telling the, the big picture of the story. Here's a quick pie chart that breaks down the major, we look at the school budget in five major categories. As I mentioned earlier, it's not unusual in a town or a school municipal budget that salaries, given that we have about 400 staff members, um, would represent 82.6% of our total 
operating general fund budget requests. So last year, I think it was 83%. So we're typically, this is very typical that we're seeing salaries represent between 82 and 83%. Um, then when you look at some other major categories, a lot of these stats and percentage breakdowns are not changing from prior year levels. Um, the operations and maintenance level certainly what is included in this category is the maintenance needs, the grounds needs, utility costs, administration costs, fixed costs, and so forth. And there's been a small increase there for, for adjustments to those line items I spoke of earlier. Um, and the biggest you know, kind of increase from last year to this year um, is in the special education tuitions line, which was about you know, a little, uh, about five, five and a half percent last year. So we're seeing that line item increase. Um, as well as a small increase in transportation. That's both special education and regular education transportation. Our regular education transportation contract, we um, contract with an outside contractor and we operate 10 buses on a daily basis. Fiscal 2019 would represent year three of that contract and in year three the rate is going up $15 per day per bus. So we've had to make an adjustment which accounted for an increase a little over $20,000 to, to the budget for next year. But pretty similar breakdown from what we've seen from prior years of these five major categories. So now to those 3.9 FTE positions driven by our strategic plan, NRPS 2021. The NRPS 2021 strategic plan looks at three major strategy areas. Uh, highlighted in the first column on the left, um, teaching and learning was, is a major strategy area. Um, technology integration is a major strategy area, and then student support services. So clearly when you look at the list of recommended positions, um, you see a common trend of student support services. It's clear that, the, that from the administration and our request to the school committee, that's certainly a priority as we look to fund fiscal 2019. Um, in the past, we certainly were able to achieve um, a lot of the technology integration uh, positions, and a couple of years ago we funded digital learning specialist and digital learning coordinator and we really moved the technology area along in previous budget cycles so there's certainly the focus uh, in some cases last year and then again in fiscal 2019 continues to be on student support services and teaching and learning and trying to bring class sizes back within optimum levels across all grade levels you know kindergarten through grade 12 and then trying to get certainly support strategies, uh, you know, address students struggling with social and emotional needs, um, certainly funded th through the budget. And we, we feel these positions certainly help enhance our services and enhance our programs on that front. Um, but the, these are listed in priority order by the administration, by the way. Um, so these would be the positions we would like to add in priority order. Um, the, top, the first one, the school adjustment council at the high school this is necess necessary to address an increasing need of student support at the high school. Currently, there's only one full-time school adjustment council that serves 808 students. Uh, this position will provide important short-term and ongoing counseling services to students who are struggling with social, emotional, and behavioral problems. Um, the remaining four positions were actually positions we did request in fiscal 2018, but unfortunately were not able to get funded uh, in the final budget that, that was supported. Um, and we felt, certainly feel they continue to be a high priority and that's why they're being recommended again for fiscal 2019. The second position is the special education elementary team chairperson. This position will assist the district with providing additional support to elementary students with special needs and allow for enhanced development of special education programs and supports that will better meet the needs of all students. Um, third position is a point for school psychologist position at the bachelor elementary school. Um, the population of the bachelor school requires additional student support in the area of testing and counseling. The bachelor elementary school, I think as many of you know, is the largest elementary school. And this point four increase will allow students to have necessary supports to access and participate fully in the general education classroom. The 1.0 FTE academic teacher at the high school. Uh, we've talked a lot about this position in prior presentations and budget cycles. We uh, continue, it continues to be a priority to help reduce class sizes and particularly in both the mathematics and science curriculum areas. Currently about 40% of core course offerings in these two departments have 28 or more students. 
40% have over 25 students. Um, so reducing class sizes will allow for more personalized instructions and thus enhanced learning. So it continues to be a high priority that the bringing those high school class sizes uh, into optimum levels. And the final position is again a repeat uh, request from last year, a .5 reading teacher at the Little Elementary School. This will allow the Little School to more fully in implement response to intervention strategies to intervene immediately for students who may be struggling. Uh, this will assist that school to provide support, necessary support to students in all grade levels. So it continues to be a high priority, providing the appropriate academic support to all students. Uh, again, total impact of this, these positions is $248,508 to the budget, um, which again would be relatively modest 0.85% increase, total increase to the budget. So now we look at this slide, which kind of breaks down what our general fund request is to the town, which would be the operating budget or our total amount we're, we're asking for to be appropriated through the general fund. And then it gives you a little bit of an idea of what actually makes up the total school funding and what funds um, the entire school budget when you look at the grants and the revolving accounts that we do get. So the school department relies very heavily um, you know, well over two and a half million dollars on an annual basis in many of the state and federal grants that we receive by the Department of Education. A lot of these grants are entitlement grants and grants that we have come to rely on and, and expect um, and most of the funding re remains relatively flat. Um, unfortunately, some of these grants in recent years have been reduced given, you know, various makeups of demographic data of our students, but, um, you know, again, th this, these grants and revolving accounts funding level change slightly from year to year based on changes in enrollment and, and so forth in, in certain programs, but uh, we do rely pretty heavily on, you know, pretty close to $2.7 million to help make the, the school budget work. So although we're requesting the town fund $31,198,533, which is a little over a $1.5 million increase for all the variety of factors I just talked about, which is again is that 5.3% increase. We then offset requests through our state grants um, and federal grants, as well as our revolving accounts. What are our revolving accounts? Those are, we, uh, we assess user fees and, and tuition to certain optional programs like the athletic program, the extracurricular student club program at the middle school and the high school, um, our tuition-based full-day kindergarten and preschool, as well as our busing program. So all those revenues flow into a revolving account and they, contribute to helping offset our total budget request to the town. And that um, doesn't always tell the full picture. So there's a lot of other sources of revenue that help flow into the school department. And over the past few years, we've worked very, very hard at doing a, a better job at accounting for the work that our booster and support groups and parent uh, you know, PTO groups do on an ongoing basis, and it's been pretty uh, incredible to see um, and to account for the variety of donations and gifts that the school community receive. In almost every meeting, and you'll see later tonight, there are about five, six, seven, or up to a dozen gifts and donations that we accept at each meeting, and they all help support the educational experience for the North Reading students. And the parent association and PTO groups at all the five schools um, budget annually costs like enrichment activities, in some cases, teacher supply reimbursements into the classroom, field trip expenses, uh, field day expenses, and just a variety of, um, of things that they do on an ongoing annual basis in the tune of about $75,000 on average. So a lot goes into making the full picture and the full North Reading student experience is what it is. So this is where we stand today, and this is, um, as Chairman Webster alluded to earlier in <coughs> Uh, the meeting, uh, significant uh, progress has been made in closing this budget gap. So when I presented on March 12th the recommended budget that you just heard this evening of the 31198533 that budget gap that I announced that evening was uh, a little over $1.2 million. Um, so significant work has been done and we certainly appreciate um, the hard work by members of the finance planning team, which is chairs and vice chairs of the three major committees in the community, the board of selectmen, the finance committee, uh, and the school committee, um, and the, the work 
of the town administrator and the town finance director to who work diligently um, and definitely put in these extra hours at this time of year every year to identify additional funds to help minimize the current shortfalls for both school and town budget so um, like I said we're extremely uh, appreciative of the work that they put into it Thanks, chairman Webster if I could we did at the last uh, finance planning team it was agreed that we would use this number tonight for available funds it has not been approved yet by the selectmen right. so at that finance planning team meeting the chair and vice chair of the selectmen's committee the chair and vice chair of the finance committee the town finance director and the town administrator all agreed with us to go forward with this number however it's not 100% locked in. Right. I, I just want to make that clear. That's a great point. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Webster. So we, we do hope and we're hopeful that that will um, continue to be supported by all members of the, the Board of Selectmen and become a reality in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but it continues to be a very fluid number. As Chairman Webster said, that we continue to get more inf information, in particular this time of year as the state budget moves its way through the, the House and, and, and approaches the Senate. and um, we get more information on fixed costs, things like health insurance and, and so forth that could change this number, but um, we are hopeful in that certainly a lot of work has been done to think creatively, think outside of the box, and think about how we can make um, the budget work. So uh, a couple more slides before I open it up to questions, but I just thought we'd have to take a quick little look at some history of funding of our school operating budget here in North Reading over the last dozen years or so. And as you can see, there's been some kind of ebbs and flows of, of financing um, and, and levels of support um, over the last you know, several years here in North Reading. Um, a lot of these flow very coherently um, and much, very much correlated with uh, off, you know, funding by state and federal uh, funding level at the state as well. Um, but the 12-year average is just under 4% that North Reading has been, been funded by their school operating budget. Um, the last two years, we've been uh, just under that 4% level, pretty close to that 12-year average at 3.8%. And as you know, um, in our recommended budget proposal, we're asking for a little bit more than that at 5.3%. At and I think that can really be described as um, just a lot of you know operational fixed cost increases that we're certainly dealing with at the school level um, some of the challenges on the special education out of district front which um, I will say is not atypical to North Reading um, if you talk to I go to a lot of meetings with many finance directors many superintendents from across the state and this is a trend and this is a you know a funding challenge that many communities certainly address when, when uh, putting together a, a, a budget and we certainly hope you know a lot of these ways that the, you know the state would 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 help us in, in, in reimburse more dollars than they do but um, you know we certainly work with what we're, we're, we're able to to have um, you know from the state and try to try to make it all work so we are asking for a little bit more than maybe what's been been typical the last few years with with our 5.3 percent budget but um, we feel it's a, a very you know somewhat modest request in some of our new initiatives which only account really for less than one percent so what can we conclude from our FY19 recommended budget? Like I said, I think it's you know, a relatively straightforward budget. I don't think there's a lot going on um, with what we're requesting. We're certainly, in what, it, what does the 5.3% budget kind of do? Well, it, it helps fund our contractual obligations with staff. It does include kind of a modest salary pool to address potential impact of teacher negotiation. So we are negotiating a new contract with the North Reading Education Association currently. Their current contract expires at the end of June. Um, and driven by the NRPS 2021 new positions that we've talked a lot about tonight already, um, additional staffing to achieve improved class sizes for enhanced teaching and learning, allow for continuing continuation of special education programs to meet the needs of students, um, social and emotional learning needs of students help us to en enhance our ability to, to meet their needs and provide additional academic support to ad identified students. It also helps us um, to properly fund you know, our operational costs to operate not only this beautiful middle school and high school campus, but as well as all of the three elementary schools. 
It allows us to meet the needs of all students, and in particular, the district's high-need student population. And then it would restore instructional expense budgets at each school. So um, you know, a lot would happen within this 5.3% budget should we be able to get it funded. So next steps. Um, as you can see, we still have a ways to go. Um, we continue to have ongoing discussions with the finance planning team. That uh, committee continues to meet on an ongoing basis. They're due to meet at the end of the month to re revisit and hopefully put the final touches on a revenue plan that would, we hope would either fund or pretty close fund the recommended budget this evening. As I mentioned earlier, the present gap over the recommended budget is 482522 um, If we back out the $248,508 of our new positions, that budget gap becomes $234,014. And that's what we're calling what would be a level services budget. Um, we're due to present this budget to the Finance Committee on April 25th. The school committee has their second budget workshop scheduled for Friday, April 27th, and they're scheduled to vote um, an official school budget on April 30th. Town meeting is on June 4th, and as I said, we will await state budget actions. Um, and I will mention um, that we are you know, reasonably confident at this point in time, based on some information that we have, has come to our attention as, as recently as this morning, that the state will, will most likely be able to increase that reimbursement rate that I sp spoke of earlier in that special education account that was funded, underfunded at 65% this year to levels that would be close to a fully funding level of 75%. We're now hearing that they could make an adjustment in this current year and increase that reimbursement rate from 65 to 72%. That would account for about $60,000 uh, for North Reading. So if that continues to get some positive news on that front, you know, we could make some adjustments to that revenue offset and help, help dip into some of these some of these offsets, some of these, these budget gaps. Um, one other note on some things that could change between now and April 30th that could help us find some additional revenue is um, the district has also filed for what is known as extraordinary relief. And that is a program that exists at the state level, again, with special education uh, reimbursement account, that if your expenses in any given year um, exceed prior year levels by you know close to 25 percent or greater you can file for what is known as extraordinary relief and receive additional funding so we actually feel like we met that threshold we did submit a claim um, that was those claims were due on march 30th so where the the uh, dese and department of education's financial office is reviewing our claim the month of april they'll review it they'll, they'll ask questions but we are reasonably confident that that uh, will receive some additional funding on that front as well um, which could, again, help us um, you know, reduce these shortfalls or these budget gaps that we're seeing right now. So we're going to be paying close attention to what's happening at the, the state level and what's happening with these two accounts that I, I spoke of um, over the next few weeks. But we think we'll have some much more concrete information prior to the school committee vote on April 30th, and we hope prior to the school committee budget workshop on April 27th as we workshop these, this, this budget. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'm going to turn it over to members of the school committee and Chairman Webster for further discussion and questions. Thank you, Michael. Great job, as usual. And we have discovered that if you ask Michael, like what's on page 97 of the budget, he doesn't even have to look. He knows, sure. which is great, but a little odd. But we, <laughs> we love him for that. Um, before we get into uh, audience uh, community questions, I'm going to ask school committee members for any comments, concerns, or questions. I guess I'll just start, I'll start down the end with Scott. Do you have anything specific you want to address at this time? Um, I guess, I mean, my comments in general, I mean, first I would just like to thank some people because when we started this, we were about $1.2 million away. And so the finance planning team and the Board of Selectmen in particular have done a lot of work to try to find revenues to support this. In addition, you know, the work that the PTOs do because there's a lot of things that are not funded. The reality is last year these suggested positions, I don't think a single one of them was funded. Um, right. So literally all that happened last year was there were cuts from the current positions or from the current uh, budget. And 
we have done everything we can to try to find funds. The extraordinary relief that uh, Michael talked about, I mean, first of all, to say that the special education went up 25, more than 25% from the year before to even be eligible for that tells you how, how much of a constraint that we're in. And just the fact that we have people here that know about those, you know, those programs to try to get that money, which will, again, hopefully help us to fund something this year. Um, you know, and then the special education costs, I mean, I think we'll talk a little bit more later on about, you know, what the positions are and the priority of them. But I think, I think the administration and the school committee want to prioritize first and foremost safety and then trying to attack budget drivers such as special education. And the top positions on there do exactly that because, you know, trying to have an adjustment counselor, one for 800 plus students in the high school when, you know, the suggested levels are far lower than that. Um, it, to me, it does create a safety issue. I mean, I think you do have to have, you know, you can't just have 800 kids and not, you have to be able to treat the people there appropriately and diagnose issues. And some of the, what we're trying to do is really try to focus on addressing issues in the elementary earlier so that we hopefully can get a little bit of control on these special education costs going forward. And so I appreciate you know, the budget that was created. Again, at the end of the day, we're not gonna be able to fund all of it. We, I think we all realize that, but just trying to do this and trying to find every, every last dollar we can is, is important. Jerry. Yeah, I just wanna follow up on what Scott said uh, and acknowledge the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Schultz and Ms. Manapelia here tonight, but they've been very, very creative. Uh, I think Mr. Prisco was leading the charge but uh, very creative in trying to come up with a revenue plan that helps uh, shorten the gap that we have in our operating budget. I think um, it's, it's creative, it's out of the box thinking, it's a little bit risky I think in some ways, but they did for us create an additional $721,000 to work with and, and we really appreciate that. Really the second year in a row that they've done that, last year they got very creative with the uh, health insurance and the way they handled the health insurance, so <laughs> we appreciate it. They've saved us from drowning, but I think we're still treading water in a lot of ways, as long as we have this type of a budget gap. So um, that's pretty much my comments for right now. Janine, anything? Um, well, to echo the, all the hard work that you all did, just put a step higher and find some more. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said to them. Can we take this a little bit further, a little bit more risk maybe? <laughs> no. Um, all kidding aside, this is a huge help to get us to where we need to be, or, or closer to where we need to be. Um, I know over the years when we do just the level services, um, that covers pretty much just like the, the cost of living increase, but we are desperately in need of more teachers and more psychologists and more people to help all with the special education. And some of the, the positions that we've added in the past couple of years are things that we've been on um, on our radar for like over six to eight years, sometimes 10 years. So I, I would like to see us be able to get what we need quicker and not have to be a have to situation. So, you know, all joking aside, if there's any way to get more money, um, it would be great. Mel, I just wanted to say one more thing too. The, this budget that we presented tonight is not even our wish list budget. Right. Our wish, li wish list budget goes much further and much more creative, creating yeah. a foreign language department and things of that nature. And that budget, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, was is a million three hundred sixty-four thousand dollars out of. Yeah. Uh, is it an yes. eight point something percent increase? Yeah. This this slide right actually. There. So again, you've looked at that, but that's where we'd like to be going. Uh, but we realize that's not possible at this time. But and when yeah. I say we're treading water. Every year we come in for this uh, level services budget and that's exactly what we're doing. We're basically maintaining what we already have, so. Julie? That was my comment as well. I mean, our administrators work very hard to come up with a strategic plan for the school district. And I feel that we haven't been addressing that plan and we're not really addressing it for this coming year as well. There's a few positions that I feel are very, very important, specifically, the high school school adjustment counselor, the bachelor school psychologist, as well as the high school academic teacher, I feel are the most important positions. But I see the, the rationale for the remaining two positions, and I trust our administrators. You know, they discuss at length the needs of each particular building, and I, I think it's something that we need, 
he needs to support. And I'll just, just to be, so everyone's clear, the money, the additional money that the uh, selectmen and finance committee have creatively come up with also benefits the town. It's not all coming to the, um, to the school department. So, cause the town also has a fairly wide budget gap at this time. Uh, the other thing I'll add to Julie's uh, comment about the positions, I know we're in the business of educating kids. That's, that's what we do. But there's, there's a, to me, there's a critical position on here that kind of got shunted all the way down to the bottom of the list, which is a, a facilities engineer. This, this campus is so complicated, we have to hire a lot of outside services to maintain the technology in this building. And by technology, I don't mean the commu computers your kids use. I mean the HVAC. I mean the, um, the lighting. Wastewater treatment. The, the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the, the, sound, the audio technology in the school, audio and video technology. One of the things that, that we strongly believe is that by hiring a facilities engineer, we can cut out a fair amount of those costs over time and not have to use those um, businesses as much. Uh, I, again, I also want to thank the selectmen, the finance committee, the finance planning team. Uh, it's unique in this town. Other towns ask me about this all the time. This finance planning team has probably saved this community so much grief over the past 10 to 15 years because while we never agree on everything, we know it's right up front what everybody wants, what everybody needs, what everybody hopes to accomplish, and it leads to good compromises. And without these committees, you have uh, selectmen and finance committees and school committees basically just sitting there throwing things at each other around budget time. Kind of like South Korea or North Korea. South Korea. Almost, almost like that, yeah, almost like that. Mr. Bernard. I, I would just like to acknowledge too, I mean, a lot's happened in a week since we attended the board, some of us attended the Board of Selectmen meeting and, and saw the plan that was outlined and, and hopefully the, um, the full board will, will give serious consideration to. Um, to the point about our strategic plan, I do think it's important for those that are here tonight and the community to know that, um, as Mr. Venezia said, our vision is much larger than the 3.9 positions we have here, but I think to Mr. Webster's point about the spirit of cooperation that exists on the finance planning team, um, we went into this recommended budget to the school committee with the idea that we were trying to strike a balance between what we thought was reasonable and what the community's affordability would be. So a lot of people have worked very hard, including certainly our Director of Finance and Operations, and I want to publicly thank Michael for bringing us to the point where we are tonight, and he has a little bit more work to do before um, the school committee is poised to adopt a budget on, on April 30th. But, um, all of our administrative team, we have our Director of Pupil Personnel Services, Cynthia Conan, Assistant Superintendent pa Patrick Daly here, um, as well as the principals. We, we start working on the budget development in October, and it is a pretty tedious task for several months, and we, we hammer things out pretty effectively to get us to a point where we feel we can come in with a responsible recommendation um, to the school committee, and I think what we have for you tonight is, is that end result. We believe this to be a responsible budget that balances the interests of uh, our wishes as laid out in our strategic plan, but also recognizing that there are limitations on the community's ability to afford all that we want to do. So um, this is our recommended budget. Um, we are hoping for perhaps a little bit more growth between now and April 30th. What was not on the slide of the the calendar of activities is the April 26th date when that's a finance planning team meeting all right. and also an administrative council meeting. So we will be um, meeting pretty pretty laboriously over the 26th going from finance planning team where there may be some additional information that's going to help um, the administrative team uh, further modify um, a recommendation that we bring to a budget workshop with the school committee the following day, that Friday, April 27th, um, and then ultimately um, a recommendation of a voted number um, at their meeting on April 30th. So still a little bit of work to do, but the progress that we've made in a very short period of time with a, a real spirit of, of cooperation and community um, has gone a long way and, and it is certainly not something to be, um, to be minimized. So thank you. So I promise one, one last thing and I'll turn it over. I promise last thing. Uh, to me, and I think to many of the school committee members, this budget's a disappointment. And every year the budget's a disappointment. For me, one of the biggest disappointments is the foreign language program which truly doesn't start until the eighth grade here, and which we only offer two languages. I've, I've, my, I've lived here 35 years, and I still don't understand how we only offer two languages. I came from a high school where they offered six languages, including Russian and Latin. And, and I think foreign language, learning foreign language helps students to learn in every other subject. And I just wish 
one of the things we wanted to do was to start this as early as the as the sixth grade with the exploratory and then start the real foreign language program in the seventh grade. Um, it's a disappointment to all of us. We approved a Mandarin Chinese uh, program about seven years ago. It's never gotten funded. We approved it, so I guess that's some level of accomplishment. So I don't want to sound greedy, but if you want to keep up with the demands that the students are facing when they leave our campus and go to either into um, the military or into, or into a career or to college, we've got to keep offering more. So with that said, um, I'll open it up to questions and comments. If you could just pass that mic around, that's so um, Jason and Norcam can pick you up on the broadcast. Um, and then, so anybody have a question or comment? Okay. And also, could you pass the microphone back, please? Um, state your name and address, please, even though we know who you are. <laughs> yes, please. Lori Capizzuto, 12 Duane Drive. Um, I just had a question, Michael, um, on page one. If you could, please, um, under budget drivers, could you just put a dollar amount to the special education out of district cost? It's 1.3 percent. I just need to know a dollar amount. Sure. What that would be? Oh, yeah, I can give that to you exactly. And that's 1.2 percent of the increase. That's not the right. total. No, exactly. The budget. Yeah. I understand. So it's actually going up by a total of like 422 thousand dollars in the last year, and that's what's driving um, that that 1.3 percent that we, uh, I've talked about. Um, but the actual total dollar amount. Michael, it's not, the tuition increase is three seven two four six three. Yeah, and then right. we have the loss of the loss of the circuit, circuit breaker rate. funding, which brings the total to over four hundred and twenty two thousand. Okay. So that's the increase. That's the number. And the dollar amount that um, is two million eight hundred sixty one thousand eight hundred and ninety dollars. For how many students? Um, that represents a projection of 35 students. 35 students. That would be the total amount. Out of district tuitions, right? Correct. Okay. That doesn't include transportation costs. No. It does not. So. Thank you. Yeah, so transportation on top of that would be an additional 440000 So you're talking about $3.3 .3 million total yeah. around? Yeah. Thank you. And I'll just say that the transportation is offset by a grant, by a federal grant. So the majority of the transportation is offset by three hundred. $25,000 and then about the initial projection was an $800,000 offset to that special education reimbursement program from the, for the $2.8 million that we talked about. So it's not, not all of that's being funded by the, by the uh, operating budget. Michael, Thank you. could you bring your mic down just to make sure? Uh, and one thing I want to add, uh, in terms of how the circuit breaker works, because this is like one of those kind of mystery things, people, how, do, how does the state actually re reimburse? Right. Essentially, the district has to pay the first $41,300 of the students out of district tuition. After that, the state starts reimbursing us. Correct. And that amount goes up every year. Correct. One, two percent every year, approximately. Yeah, we're at we're a little over forty-two thousand dollars now. So that right. threshold increases as as all costs increase on a, on an ongoing basis. So, um, so if we have a fifty thousand dollar student. The state's reimbursing us about five thousand six hundred dollars. Yeah. A year later, which is absolutely right. insane. So you take that eight thousand dollars, and then if they fully fund it, they're reimbursing us seventy-five percent right. of eight thousand dollars. If they fully fund it, and they've come short of that this year, was it started at sixty-five, and now we think we have it potentially increasing to seventy-two but it's still not quite at a fully funded level of 75%. But it's only the difference. That right. That's only the difference. That's only that $8,000 difference. And so if you if you have students out of district below that level, you get zero reimbursement. And it and and I've always said it's it's unfair for the federal government and the state government to put those requirements on the local communities and to not help fund it. And to it, some it extent just, we have no control over how many students we have. Correct. I mean, if they right. move into the district, absolutely, we have to we have to pay for them. Sure, yeah, Michael, can, could you yes. give me a microphone? This is related to the out of district student. I we had mentioned earlier that the number itself of students is not going up; it's actually coming down. But that increase with the cost is related to change in programs. So it's just, I think that's an important distinction that people just make note of. This is not a situation where all of a sudden we have, you know. 10 new students that are going out. This is as a result of a change in placement. So 
just wanted to clarify that. The other thing with special education is, I, I don't think I've seen a year, this is my 14th year on this committee, where we haven't had one or two additional cases that crop up during the year. Either students move in, there's a change in an existing condition, there's a change in a program, and the students' needs aren't being met, and then we have to, you know, Cynthia and her team work, and we have to accommodate that student. And there's no money, there's really no money put aside to do that. So it has to come from, from somewhere else within the budget. Mr. Sh okay, woman right uh, here in the front. Just again, state your name and address, please. Uh, so Darcy Favorite and uh, Cold Spring Road. So I'm curious for the contractual services, do we have the ability to control where we are outsourcing those needs to? Do we get as the district to decide if this is the special education needs and these are the three vendors in which we can choose from? Or is it very specific and I'll there let, aren't a lot of I'll options? I'll let Cynthia um, answer that. So when we have a student that requires an out-of-district placement, the, the IEP team needs to identify those specific services that need to be in place for the student to be provided with a FAPE. So depending upon what those services are, that really determines for us where we can make referrals to. So the more intensive, the more individualized, the more tailored those needs are, sort of the, the smaller the pool becomes for us. So that, that whole decision-making process is driven by the IEP team and the IEP document itself. We, we don't really have a choice. And, and one of the things we do do, we do do, I shouldn't have said that. One of the things we do is we are a member of two consortiums and they provide services, they have schools, they have uh, programs that if possible, we direct our students to those. There's the Northeast and what's, what? Seam Collaborative. Seam Collaborative. In North Shore Educational. In North Shore Educational. And those two, they're much more cost effective for us. But in many cases, they can't meet the requirements that Cynthia, Cynthia just discussed. If a student has certain needs that don't fit into that consortium, we can't, we can't send them there. Um, and we also try, one of the things we try to do, and again, every decision is what's the best decision for the student. If we think it's best for the student to be in district in one of our programs, we'll recommend that. But that doesn't always mean that the student's going to be in the district, correct? Correct. And that's right. kind of a goal. I mean, if the student is best served in the district, I think if parents would want the student to be in the district. So, And that type of decision making is also in line with least restrictive environment, which is a law that we have to follow in special education. So we always try to achieve that to the best degree that we can. But there are times that some students' needs just go beyond the scope of what we can offer. Scott? Uh, the only other comment I would make is I, I think last year they the request that didn't get funded was for the special el special ed elementary team chairperson, which is a request. It's the number two request mm -hmm. this year again. Mm -hmm. I think the entire focus of that position is to try to create curriculum to keep more students in district and theoretically, potentially even bring tuition paying students into our district because we can create programs. We have some, we don't have a lot, but we have some wonderful programs. I mean, at the Hood School in particular, there's some programs where, you know, we, Sometimes we even rent space to other people, but if we spend the money now to put the investment in, we could potentially, even if it's not bringing students back, at least stop more students from going out and potentially, you know, have a have a great program. We have the facilities now to have great programs, and you know we have wonderful people here. If we just put the time in and create the curriculum to potentially, you know, keep more people here in the future, and you know maybe even bring tuition paying students in. Just to add, we are, our average, our percentage is pretty much the statewide average in terms of out of district costs and also overall special education. So there are numerous students who remain in the system who have individual education programs, and those are all counted within um, the special education program. Mr. Schultz, or Selectman Schultz, what, what do you prefer? Andy. Andy, okay. <laughs> Because you guys get much higher viewership than we do at our meetings, I thought it was, it's best it's not to- a very high bar. <laughs> uh, just to point out to the public, I know you guys up there probably all know this, but uh, there is help on the way with the Pulte Homes Project. We were able to raise more money this year by talking about investing some of that money and use some of the interest income to help fund the budget gap. More importantly, Pulte Homes, uh, again, I'm just saying this for people who don't know, it's a 450 unit project. They're gonna be nine buildings, 50 units at a time. The first building is going to come online in December of this year, and probably every nine to ten months the next building will come on. So 
I don't know how much you'll see in fiscal year 20, you'll see some of it, but in fiscal year 21, you'll really see it. The increase in tax revenue, property tax revenue, that's gonna, you know, the school's gonna get their share of that, and it's gonna help th these, you know, the wish list that we have and we can't make right now. And we also, I know, Slepkin, Woman, Man Manny Pelly, and myself, we're also looking at with the Pulte proceeds, investing in infrastructure projects and things that are increased our commercial tax base, because we can't hit the residents any further, but we need to get more money. So there's always that conundrum there, and that's what we're really looking to do. But you're gonna see help from the Pulte Homes money, I think, within the next year or two. Yeah, I think I think the estimated total is somewhere between two and a half, three million, maybe even more when yes. hopefully all nine buildings are built in. That's gonna be just so the public knows, that's gonna be seven years out though before it's right. fully built. So it'll be dripping out over time. But I think you'll really, you'll start seeing it in two years definitely. A little probably a little next year, but the second year you definitely will. Right. Anybody else? Select woman Manupelli. And I'll just add add to that too. And I know our chair would have been here, but he's out of out of state this evening. But I also think too that 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 this team and the financial team is aware that, um, and but the, maybe the general public isn't. Whenever there are any additions to staffing, it also drives up the town right. budget. So the health insurance comes right off the top of the town budget and isn't incorporated into the school budget. So although it makes practical, logical sense to seek these positions, there's also a number of town positions that unfortunately we just don't have the funding right now to, um, to agree to or a wish list from the town. We followed the same format as the school department because we think the school department's format of this projected strategic plan is, is fabulous. So we asked we've asked for the first time our town departments to do the same thing and believe it or not there's a quite a significant need for increase of services increase of staffing for town as well so it's it's almost like a bridge year with what was being done one time funding and where so we have caps in terms of what we can do and shifting funding around and freeing up some funding it's not i don't want there to be a picture that we can somehow find more of that either. I don't want there, that to be a misunderstanding. And, and it's also one-time funding to be able to address not just the school budget gap, but our budget gap as, as uh, members have noted. So um, we, we do think, and I, I totally agree, I think every single one of these, it would be nice to add 15 of these. It would be nice to get us another one of our um, you know, st st student coordinator services more than one, and I, and it would be great. It's a great it's a great goal long term. But if we can just hold on until, you know, we get these these ty type of revenues coming in once this is fully developed, I think that's where we'll be able to meet a lot of these long term goals. And also, just one more thing about the Pulte homes is some a little bit of misunderstanding that maybe we can give you know. Candy kisses, fifth five hundred dollars to each resident, or things like that. We can't do that with the funds; they're restricted in terms of what we can do. As uh, as um, my fellow selectmen said, you know, we're restricted in terms of utilizing those funds for infrastructure and capital improvements for right. the town. So right. that's sort of a limited scope to use them. But we're trying to be creative to assist with these sort of bridge, we know we have to bridge the gap here, so. Just just to expand a little bit, and, and just a, a primer for those of you who are new to the process, the way the budget works is, before anybody gets anything, they take off the t uh, top costs off the top. That's basically health insurance and retirement are the two main ones there, and those are huge. Those, uh, it's 10, probably, I don't know how many million dollars it is, but for the school department, it's huge because we have 400 employees and not everybody takes health insurance. Well, so like said that health insurance is about a $15,000 add on to the right. salaries that each employee projected on each of those employees. Right. So. so, so we don't, the town and the school don't start divvy, divvying up the money until those two things are lopped off the top. And it's many millions of dollars. Over $21 million. $21 million. Did you have? Scott, Jerry, okay. The, uh, the only other thing I would say is, I mean, I, th I think I, I appreciate what the selectmen have done the last couple of years because what I don't like is saying, here's the budget driver, we can't do anything about it. I think the selectmen creating the Barry project is going to be is going to be a game changer for this town. I mean, hopefully, it can help get sewer, it can help you know expand the commercial tax base. The money even right now is being used to try to help you know with, with gaps. They've also attacked the uh, one of the other big drivers, which is the uh, 
health insurance, you know, and they've found a creative way to do that. I think we're trying to do the same thing here with special education needs. You know, we have a legal obligation, but we have a moral obligation to educate every child, give every child an accessible education. And, you know, unfortunately, we can't always put that off for two or three years either. We have to make sure that we're educating all of the kids in the school now as well, which is what we're really fighting for. You know, we're trying to make sure that, you know, we give the best education we can to everyone. We try to make sure that, you know, again, the earlier we can identify needs in young students, we can hopefully address them early on. And maybe it, it means that somebody, a student, when again, it'll be hard. We've talked about in the workshop, you know, it's not like a business where we can run, you know, this is what the request on investment is going to be. We're going to save, you know, $300,000 by funding this position this year. There's no way to identify that, but, you know, we have to work with what we have. And we think that if we invest in this now, we're attacking this issue that is not getting smaller. It's becoming bigger and bigger each year. I saw Mr. Schultz had the comment a question. Does anybody else have anything? I'm going to go. To, I'm going to go to Miss Manipelli first, Mr. Schultz. Just to add. Sorry about that. And one one, one last thing that I mic. wanted yeah. to add to that, and this isn't a fun process. I wouldn't call it fun, but I would say, and I'm I'm in total agreement. I, I think everybody at the table is mission oriented. We're all we're all oriented to the same planning goals. And we're all in agreement of the needs. We we know the needs. We've defined the needs, and we we need to get there, and we need to work together. And I think people are working well together to get there too. So that that's it. Thank you, Kate. That's it. And just real quick, Mr. Chairman, you just pointed out it was your Mr. Venetti. I'm not sure, but the health insurance. I don't think the public realizes how much that goes up every year. That's we're doing some things to drive that cost down, but the hard cost of it, it goes up double digits every year. And if you do that five years in a row, I mean, it's the rules of 72. Every, you know, every 7.2 years, it's going to double. And when you have prop two and a half and you have some, this one cost that's going up 10%, you can just do the math. And that's, in my opinion, one of the biggest issues that we have is trying to tamp that down and keep that under control because it's just not sustainable. I mean, the way I, I'm a small business owner, I see it personally. It goes up much higher than your other costs every year, and your revenues don't go up with the same proportion that your health insurance goes up. And I don't know if the public truly knows that, but that's a big driver. And our selectmen have gotten incredibly creative and really developed a model program that I know at least one other school district or uh, the town of Hamilton, I believe, or the town of Wenham, one of the two, is adopting the same program that we adopted last year. We became the first community in the state. And you know the, the, the forward-looking vision of the selectmen and the town administrator and the town finance director and the town HR director to put in place a program that was a little risky. It's in, in I think Mr. Venetzi, it's a little risky because we're um, buying a less expensive health insurance program and then we're self-funding some of it and hopefully that self-funding is enough and it turns out to be a heck of a lot less expensive and it worked really well this year. This was the first year and our and and our um you know the return has been great so but that if they didn't do that last year we would have been in a huge budget hole same thing this year if I'm wrong, i think it was a difference between 10 and a half percent increase last year and two percent right something like that a right a little yeah. higher but yeah it's even with the savings it's still right passes the revenue increase yeah. right that's yeah does anybody else have anything they want to have done so well i've got complete confidence in them they can come up with just a little you can bit tell who's better. retiring they're really they're, they're, they're i'm actually going to move tonight that both <laughs> selectmen and school committee salaries increase 100 percent next year i think that would be very helpful <laughs> question over here hi i'm stacy de carlo kristen lane i had a quick question about the accepted donations looks like there's about two hundred fifty thousand dollars that you get? I think it's... We accept all donations. <laughs> um, I wondered that. Are they earmarked? How do you decide how to spend those? So the, um, the person making the donation has to set a, a purpose, and then there needs to be spent on that purpose that donation is, is coming in. And the school committee accepts all donations and generally can fund um, you know, te te technology, equipment, athletic supplies, School uh, trips. Yeah, school school trips. School field trips. Um, there's been a variety of donations from uh, booster support groups, our private donors, um, but it's, it's essentially a lot of enrichment. You know, there's, there's extra supplies and equipment um, for playgrounds. Boosters. At the, at the middle school, uh, 
that, that got funded over the last couple of years. And how much is that? It was 200000 wasn't it? That was over 100000 100000 yeah. I mean, um, we athletic had... The athletic field down at right. the... At the uh, the athletic field was 140000 where we put the um, irrigation and the sod in. That was 100% funded. funded outside of the budget. We have seven donations on our agenda tonight, and that's about average. And right. that can go anywhere yeah. from a couple thousand dollars to ten, fifteen thousand dollars. A lot of technology equipment that helps that we, we've seen in the past, and athletic athletic equipment, and athletic supplies, and so forth. A lot of it, the parents' association raises. A lot of it, uh, teacher, uh, the in-kind donations, things like teacher luncheons, teacher appreciation gifts for the um, from the parent organizations, enrichment. Yeah. enrichment programs, bringing in speakers and entertainers for the students. Yeah, we actually University. published the, uh, an annual list of the donations we've accepted on the, the school website. So if you're interested to see the whole breakdown of the amounts over the last couple of years, if you go to the, the budget of the, the district administration you know, budget pages, you'll see a, a link to donations. And you can actually download the full list that was accepted you know, last year and we'll be updated every year. So it's been, it's been pretty incredible what, what we've accepted over the last few years. And, and just to be clear, though, so it, it's not the school committee raising this. Any any organization that's raising it for, you know, booster clubs, PTOs, you know, all of those organizations, the money eventually comes in as a donation to the school committee. And so, you know, the little school playground, all that money was donated to the little school. That was then donated to the school committee to then pay for the funds. And so that was just done as a, as a control on the money because, you know, they're concerned making sure that groups, all the money was being raised in one in one location so it's not separate from the other fundraising outside of it it is the fundraising that you see around town another big popular area for donations is to offset costs of the annual middle school trip to washington dc so we try to provide um, scholarships to families who can't afford to come up with the total cost of the trip so those families i think the last several weeks we've mm -hmm. <coughs> accepted donations from parents or community members to help offset the costs of the um of the tuition of the of the overall cost for the middle school trip to, trip, trip to Washington. If you look at our agenda, it's very specific as to what the donation is for. They, right. They, yeah. They yeah. market it. Yeah. yeah. Like Parent University was fully funded right. by private donations because, again, we can't take money out of the budget to pay for a lot of these things. It has to come from other sources outside of this. And so, well, I, I mean, I, I thought Parent University was was very successful and great. And again, I wouldn't have necessarily taken money out away from other things that are needed for that. So it's great that we find you know, private individuals and companies that, that will support those initiatives. And on top of that, when you, the revolving funds also come from residents. That's almost a million dollars, Michael, in tuitions, athletic fees, busing fees, and uh, activities fees. Right. So that's about a million dollars. It is. And that offsets costs of the programs. All of that stuff should be free. That should be part of a public education. And if we had to, if we didn't have those, um, if we didn't have tuition for kindergarten, we wouldn't have full day kindergarten here because it would cost us about six hundred fifty thousand dollars to implement that. And Michael has gone to the state at least a couple of times trying to figure out how we can get more state uh, support for that. And there's nothing. Almost 50% of our high school athletic programs are funded through the revolving account, which comes from fees from the parents. Right. So that's almost half. And if we didn't, again, we'd, we'd have to cut sports if we didn't have the fees. So anything else? Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned kindergarten. <laughs> that was going to be my next topic. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to clarify. I did attend the webinar, and thank you for offering that online option um, for some of the budget information. And I, you said a couple times that there is no staffing reductions in the kindergarten program for next year. Uh, there are seven FTEs this year and next year, I believe. Um, but I think that the parents and the teachers would look at it a little bit differently. There are eight classrooms currently, and next year there will be seven classrooms. So <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure I don't think that all parents necessarily understand. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, this year there are four full day classes two half-day classes and two hybrid classes in the district and next year there will be seven hybrid classes in the district i believe that's what is in this budget to be funded so um, there are so currently there are four there are actually six uh full day kindergarten classes um i'm oh, sorry five and then in two hybrids so seven total 
before their kindergarten, two of which are hybrid and post-school. And then there are two other half-day kind of kindergarten sections. Right. So the, there was actually um, the budget proposal in FY19 does include, when I said the, the same seven full-day kindergarten sections, um, because of the enrollment was so uh, reduced from the previous year, um, all seven of those full-day kindergarten sections, the plan would be that they would be all, all of those would be hybrid. Right. Right. So I understand that. I understand that that's what's being funded, but I just. I'm not sure that that's being communicated to parents in a way that they know that when you're entering the school system, your child may be, you know, you're, you're paying and your child will be with kids who are leaving halfway through the day. Um, you're not paying and you're in the classroom with kids who are staying for much longer. I think it's something that's come up and, and I haven't been involved in the years past, but I know that everyone has been creative in trying to come up with ways to provide full day for because that is a demand in the community um, but I'm not sure if the community loves the hybrid approach I'm not sure if that's well what's your issue with it so what does she but she said she wasn't she hasn't been involved before we did a survey and the survey I would say was a hundred percent satisfactory well it was highly satisfactory yeah. and I do think that the possibility of the hybrid model being instituted in fact I know it is as part of the orientation program that the Prince elementary principals run for incoming parents, mm -hmm. so I, I'm confident that it's communicated at that meeting. In fact, and, and I'm, you know, we haven't made a decision on this, but there is a good chance that going forward, the hybrid model will be the model to offer, depending on yeah. enrollment, because it allows us to have full day and half day where we might not be able to correct. offer everybody full day kindergarten. Isn't that That's correct? Right. I think that was the goal that drove it, was that if a family wanted full day kindergarten, we were fairly committed to making sure that that would happen. A few years ago, not everybody got right. Right. full day kindergarten. Right. I wasn't, I mean, I said I'm not involved, I'm not involved in the incoming kindergarten class, but I have two kids that have already been through it, and one ended up in half day, one ended up in full day. There were different circumstances. Well, I think our goal as a school committee was to be able to provide full day kindergarten for every <coughs> student or every child that wanted it. Yeah. I think, well, I think also, I mean, without going through the whole history, I mean, I think, the challenge this year, when you look at the projected enrollments for next year, the Batchelder has 13 half-day kids, the Hood has seven, and the Little has five. And so the, they, I mean, it, when we look at the budget gaps right now, I mean, we couldn't have a whole class with five students in it, you know, or, or seven students in it. And that's, that's one of the biggest challenges here is that, you know, the full day off option has been, you know, very well, you know, requested in the past. And I think, I mean, I was, attending meetings when p parents were here upset because their student had to go to half day because the full day slots were all taken. And I think the committee did a good job of finding a way to say we're going to let everybody, you know, go to full day, you know, wherever, you know, no, even if you have to go to a different school. And then the, then the concern was that, you know, there were open slots for full day in another school. And, you know, we, we, it was like a lot of people had to move. And so by doing the half day, by doing the hybrid program, it was a way to get, keep more students in the district that they're in. And so unfortunately, there are still a few people that can't. It would be great. I mean, I would love to have full day offered. I, I think it should be mandatory. I think it should be fully funded by the state, but it's not right now. And you know, working with the budget constraints, I just think this is, it, it's one of those things where is it a great solution? No, but is it better than all the other alternatives? I, I think it is from what I've seen. And so. I mean, again, a lot of it comes down to the numbers where, you know, when you have 23 kids in certain elementary classes, just have five kids in a class, it's just not something that can be done successfully. And again, in years where like if there was, you know, 18 kids that were half day, then yeah, it might make sense to have an eight, uh, a class of 18 students that were half day. But I just think looking at this year, it just doesn't seem like the numbers support that. And one of, kindergarten is probably the most difficult issue that we have. Um, what, two years ago, um, we asked the superintendent to look at a redistricting plan for elementary schools because of the different sizes of the schools. And the elementary principals spent a, a basically a year looking at that, and it really didn't make any sense to redistrict Correct. because we weren't gonna be gaining anything. The issue with kindergarten is, you never, you kind of know, but you never know how many kids you're gonna. We don't, we don't even know now. I mean, we have registration, but.
but between now and yeah, we're pretty, I think, pretty firm in our numbers well, right we'll now. We'll get a few more. It could change. Yeah, we'll get a few more registrations. In. Yeah. I, I mean, I and it's, I understand the concern that parents have because for them, it's kind of the first time their kid's going to school, right? And you want the best experience possible. And I think we try to do that, but it's, yeah. I, I think it causes more um, consternation amongst the committee members and between the committee and the community and between parents than just about any other issue that we have. And it's every year. It's every year. The scenario changes right. every yep. year. It you know, does. The numbers and I change. appreciate the work. I know that it's been addressed several times, and I appreciate the work that you've done to come to the point where it seems as though full day is what's the priority. Hybrid seems like the best option that might be available. Um, but it does feel from the parent perspective like you're putting out fires all the time and parents aren't being notified when their school is the one that's about to be affected by it. So first the, um, you know, first it was at the batch and then the little tried something new and then they went, it went to the hood this year and they're doing it and now the batch is doing it next year. And, and I'm grateful to have friends all over town and I get lots of phone calls from lots of people saying, oh my gosh, didn't this happen to you and now this is happening to us and wait, what worked out here and does your, you know, whose kid liked having, leaving this. early and whose kid liked staying later. I'm um, glad they're calling you and not us. That's yeah. A, that's a big plus. <laughs> Thank you. Right, yeah. I, I I'm just, fielding I, a lot of it and, and I, I think that there is an increasing number of parents who want to get involved and, and be productive and not just register complaints and, um, you know, and I've asked that question, where, where do we go with, with this I, concern about it? And it, it's not always fair, I don't think, to burden the superintendent or the principals individually, and I don't think that's a, a productive way to, um, to collect feedback either. I, you know, I mean, then you're just dealing with irate parents here and there, and, and nothing's coming of it. So I think that there, there does seem to be a large number of parents getting more and more involved. I noticed on the budget website that someone happened to post the kindergarten analysis from fiscal year 2015. I don't know if that was just a major coincidence or if there was something you were preparing to point us to um, if this issue came up, but there is something on the budget website right now about why Lake Kindergarten wasn't funded in town. All right. Um, anyway, I think that was from a I, few years ago. Yeah. And I think yeah. parents are ready to work together and talk about it again. I would just remind folks that in, in my first year as a superintendent, 2014-15, is when I did assemble a working group of parents who mm -hmm. wanted to talk about kindergarten and what changes could we make. And it was at that time that the spirit of full-day kindergarten for those families who wanted it, regardless of where they would go, and people, when they register their children, check a box that they, they're, they're, they're open to the idea of open enrollment, that they know that if they get full-day kindergarten, it may not be in their home school district. I think a lot has been done in the last three years to better communicate to families what's available to them before they even move into town. Um, we did a substantial amount of work on the website. We have a whole kind of a Q&A page um, for parents to visit. I think our, our orientation program is much more informative. Just respectfully take exception to the fact that people don't know going into the orientation what might happen in the fall. I think it's very clearly communicated that the hybrid model is available across the district and it's driven solely by the needs. It's, it's driven solely by what, what school has what number of full day or half day um, enrollments. And so when we, when we do the orientation, we really don't know if we're gonna use the hybrid or what school it's going to be at because once people register, that's when we then do the kind of the, the putting together of the puzzle to say, okay, it looks like the hybrid would work here based on the numbers that enrolled at the Batchelder School, the Hood School, or the, or the, or the Little School. So and just to that's address- just, That's the process. So if parents are looking to, to reassemble and, and revisit that, you know, after three years, I haven't heard that, but I'm certainly not opposed to that. To address the funding issue with the state, one of the issues that we face in North Reading is we're already above, even though we feel we don't get enough money from the state, we're already above the minimum level of Chapter 70 funding. So if we were below that level, and if we went to them and said, we're going, we, we're, we're going to eliminate tuition for kindergarten, we could get a lot more money per student. But because we're above minimum percentage, which is what, 17.5%? It's mm -hmm. our target, right. Yeah, our target. Yeah. 
we would basically get. If we wanted to, to go tuition-free kindergarten, say it's 100 kids, we'd get $20 per kid. So we'd get, we'd get uh, $2,000 if my math is good, and it costs 650000 to run the program. Yeah, so a few years ago, we did that, the PowerPoint that you referenced that we did make available on the website was in, a lo in, in large part to you know, bring some clarity around the fact that you know, the Chapter 70 formula, which certainly funds the, you know, education, is not a kind of a one-size-fit-all. And you know, there were some communities a few years ago that were making the change to free grade kindergarten, and they were benefiting greatly with additional state funding. In North Reading, unfortunately, because of where we fall with that formula, is not one of them that would benefit. Um, so it would be a significant budget challenge for us to, to make that change. Whereas some area communities were able to do that and receive a, a great, a huge, significant increase in state aid, and, and that's all related to where we stand with the, our, our target aid. So North Reading is, is well above what our target Chapter 78 should be. So when you make a major change like that and you, you know go to a, fr a free you know, full day kindergarten, uh, we would default to the minimum aid, which is about twenty or twenty five dollars per pupil. So we're talking like three or four thousand dollars. Where if we were closer to our target, as Chairman Webster alluded to, we could see a, a much greater increase. You know, all of our I'm sorry. No. So that was all of our fees, whether it's athletics, busing, kindergarten, they're all because we are not required to offer those services. And if we're going to offer them, the only way we can afford to do it is to charge a fee. Since I've been on this committee, I always felt it was better to give the parent the choice. Instead of saying, look, we don't want to charge a fee for busing, we just won't offer it. We'll only offer it for the for the mandatory or the required busing. Same with kindergarten, same with athletics. So what we do is we basically say we can't afford it, but if people want to participate in it, we're going to give them an option to do that, and people have chosen that as, as an option for athletics, for activities, for busing, for kindergarten. So. Right. But again, if, if, there's, if there's significant parent interest, as Mr. Bernard said, and he he's not shy about convening meetings. He'll convene a meeting and on most topics, most topics, not all topics. I can't think of one that I haven't. Right. <laughs> so and there's a wide range of them. And he's definitely calls, then you call. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. He's so. definitely the right person to contact, and um, it is a good use of his time because kindergarten is is as it's a major program. It's your entry into the school system. Right. Julie, I mean, I echo your concerns. My daughter's in third grade, and I was very confused you know, when she was going to kindergarten, so quite a few years ago. And I think if we did have, this is our program. I mean, I'm very in favor. If we're doing hybrid, just do it every year. I know that's a consideration. You have to look at numbers to see if that's even financially feasible, mm -hmm. if offering a separate program is. But I think as far as communication to parents, this is what we offer. This is what you can expect. I think that would help. <laughs> I believe we're doing that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was gonna say. I, I don't, I certainly don't mean to accuse the, anyone of not trying to disseminate the information. And with my marketing background, I know you can tell people something a million times and they're, they're not gonna have heard it. But, but from the parent perspective, there's a lot of people who, who started the school year not realizing that their child was um, in a classroom where kids were leaving early. Now, maybe that was, and I hope and assume it was communicated to them a few times, but, um, I shouldn't even say this because I'm leaving in 27 days, but um, <laughs> so uh, do we still have parents that are experiencing trauma over their classmates leaving while they're still in school or vice versa? Or is that still an issue? Well, that the part of the issue is I think some parents didn't even know that that was the situation that their their students were in. So right. I, does that be a good issue not I'm, to bring us because it's yeah. Well, I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm curious about the the feedback that you said you did a survey and and got wonderful feedback on it. I'm I'm would be interested in revisiting that and we, getting feedback from now that lots of schools have done that. Yep. Many school districts do have that same program. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I know Linfield had yeah. it, Reading has it. So I mean, it's not like we're the only ones doing and it. And I'm not saying that it's it's the, a bad idea necessarily, yeah. but I'm, I'm not convinced that parents are as informed about it as we'd like to think, and I'm not convinced that they like it as much as we think. Parents on both sides of it. Um, so to be making the decision to to be saying all things are the same, there's no staffing adjustments, um, when in fact, of course, there is one less teacher, one less classroom being offered. Um, you know, I just wanted to make sure the parents are aware that there is True. seven That's hybrid no. classes. Yeah, they have to move up. There is no staffing reduction. So, 
Well, but there are there are the two half the, day the is small. classes right. in the district. That's right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. So the the kindergarten is, is smaller, so there's probably more uh, more there's fewer kindergartens next year. Correct. Right. So that's where she's saying so staffing is lower. There's fewer. There but that staff is not being laid off. They're right. Just going yeah, to there's different. There's level staffing at the elementary level, Correct. K through grade five. And this happens every year. Yes. The changes in enrollment. Grade one enrollment mm -hmm. changes, grade two, grade yep. three. Yep. So staffing sometimes has to you know, change and go from one grade or a school to, a, to another. But um, based on the enrollment, kindergarten through grade five, next year there are no, there are no staffing. Right, but, but kindergarten so. only. So parents who think that they're, they're selecting a half-day kindergarten class because they know the half-day teacher, they had the half-day teacher before, that's what they were right. expecting to get, that's not. That's well, not well we, we adjust, again, we have enrollment. We have 20 students at the little school, or 25 students max. That's one class. A high, we, can't ha we have five half-day students. That's correct. We can't have a class for five students. <laughs> But wait, right. it's not it's not fiscally responsible. You no. wouldn't want this, us to overstaff so that we wouldn't have to move people around or. In this that, current year, it? enrollment caused us to bump up That's our correct. teaching staff. Like this current school year, there was an additional. This never is it 40 students or something like that that 40, we had 40, to increase? Uh, 40 40 yeah. students more than we, we expected. Had, we actually added a kindergarten and the FY18 budget this year. funded an additional kindergarten section. Based on enrollment. Based on enrollment in this in this cohort of right. students. That's dynamic is changing a little bit next year. Right. Um, but there's needs in grade one because now you have a larger kindergarten cohort moving to grade one. So that might shift, but it's, you know, we consider it level staffing when you look at the larger picture. Right. From a budget, stand grade from a budget standpoint, it would yeah. be, but from a class <coughs> being offered to children, there are less being offered. Just to be clear, every teacher who wants to work in North Reading next year will have a position. Every teacher has been offered a position who currently works in North Reading. Just to be clear. I, I am very clear on that. I have shared that with many people as well. And well, and it's, wait, it's wait. a fact. And just, just, just to clarify one thing about the changing, the bachelor doesn't have it as much because the class sizes are fairly consistent in the hood as well. But at the little, it looks like every single grade level is going to change the, the, what teachers are there next year because you have classes of 56 and then 44 and 53 and then 43. And so you can't split up 53 kids into two classes or 56 kids. You're putting 28 kids in the class. So that those classes that are larger need to get broken up into three sections. So there's some that are two sections, three sections, two sections, and it, and it varies year from year. The bachelor, bachelor is fairly consistent with the exception of one, and the hood is fairly consistent as well. But it's just because of the little school, there's just those there's, the there's less enrollment at the little school, so, so right. when there's only two and three sections, that can vary a lot more than when we have four mm -hmm. sections, yeah. say, at the batch elder. Correct. Yeah. Someone else have a... Yes. Um, thank you. So I'm, I think I'm with Stacy so Darcy from Cold Spring Road. Um, I, I would like to perhaps take an alternative thought process. So I had the, um, the great fortune. My daughter was in the pilot program of the hybrid class at the little school, my oldest, and it was wonderful. I will just speak Miss Molly's praises and how she put together the program, how she communicated it. Mrs. McBride was the administrator, the teacher for the classroom with Miss Filippo. It was wonderful. My key concern is that the entire, um, the, all of the pool who were facilitating it were on board, thought it was a wonderful idea, were engaged in the process. And so my, my concern, is, as Stacy is saying, is there might not be as much community involvement. So as new parents who were in this hybrid program, we sat down during the open house with Mrs. McBride, with Mrs. Molly, and asked all of our questions. And they were really clear to be descriptive, to say, we are trying this, we are feeling it out, we're gonna fumble along the way. But I, I guess I do agree that it doesn't necessarily feel like that kind of gentler communication style has taken place on how it was applied this year. So perhaps it has been a bit of a difference in year over year. Again, I, I think it is really a wonderful program. I see its benefits. I see how it helps with the fluctuation in, in headcount. But I think what we all talk about is what's in the best interest of the student? What does that student who's the half day kid experience? What does that student who is the full day kid experience? So my daughter who watched her classmates come in 
They all got ready together. So at the little school, Miss Molly instituted recess before lunch. So when I asked my kindergartner, well, what happens to your friends? Do they just get up and leave in the middle of the day? Do they all have to put on their coats and you, you have to watch them go? And she says, no, you know, mom, we all get dressed together and we all go outside together and it's not disruptive. That was a wonderful segment, I think, or a segue to introduce the hybrid program for these students. It didn't feel like the half day children were missing out on something because everybody got, to get, got up together, everyone left at the same time. I don't know that that practice is instituted across the other elementary schools. Does a half day kid feel like I'm missing out on the afternoon session, that they're gonna do something that I don't get to do? Conversely, the curriculum was condensed and it has to be. The, the principals have been clear, you, you know, superintendent were really clear that it is going to be a condensed curriculum because you only have these kids for half a day and then the afternoon session is an opportunity to continue to revisit, to, you know, do a bit of a deeper dive, to have free play, which is always helpful in the kindergarten environment. But again, the afternoon kids are having a, 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 a more of a forced curriculum in the morning session because of the choice, again, that they didn't make that their parents were given. So I, I do think that there is an opportunity to do some brainstorming, and I know that, that perhaps um, we as a parental group can refresh ourselves on, on how it was approached, but when we really think why we're here, it's what's in the best interest of the kids. And so I think that there's an opportunity in both directions to see, you know, we talk about the program and the, what is the experience that a child who goes, instead of being able to be at the little school, to the hood school, because that's where the opening is. Well, they build connections for 180 days and then they don't see those kids again because they get, as a first grader, right. put back in the little school or the kid that goes from the hood to the batch. I mean, the kids being moved around, we're, wonder, we're fortunate, they're young, they're generally transient, but it still affects them. And so we do want to think about ways that we can help as parents to provide support, to provide the, that um, communication plan with them because why does, the person who lives here get to go to, has to go to that school, but the kid who lives next door gets to go to this one. Like, again, it's about the kids. What do they? What is best for them? And I think you know prioritization is another component of this program. And in the lottery system, the way that it's assigned today, if you have a, a student, so I have this example for myself. I have a first grader. I have a child who's going to start the little elementary, or excuse me, the little preschool program next year. But I run the risk that even though she's in the little preschool, she could be in the hood or she could be in the batch for kindergarten, even though her sister's in the little school and she's been in the little school. They, I think, again, it's what's in the best interest of the kid. How can we make sure it feels as supportive as possible? And I think that is what I would like to, to work on and I would be more than happy you know, with other parents to try to figure out ways to do that. I, I'm not opposed to being creative. Um, I will tell you that everything we do is in the best interest of the student. If that student doesn't go to the hood school, they're not going to have full day kindergarten if the parents want it. Is that fair? Do we say, okay, you can't have full day? You so they have class sizes of five kids in a, in a right. class. That would be in the best interest of the kid to have one teacher and five kids, but it doesn't always work out that way. It's not always practical. This year we have 42 fewer kindergarten students. Of course we're going to have less sections. Maybe it hasn't been communicated correctly, but we have 42 fewer kindergarten students this year. Last year we had more than we expected. This year we had fewer than we expected. Correct. And because we're a small district, we're constrained as to how much we can do. You've got kids at the bachelor in a certain grade that might have 22 kids in a class in the third or fourth grade. And over in the little school, there's 17. Or 16. And, and, and that's just the way the numbers fall. <laughs> is it more advantageous to have a class with 16 in it than it is to have 22 in it? Absolutely. But you can't you just can't balance it out all the time. I, I would just say, I mean, I, okay, there's two different issues here. And so uh, on the first issue of offering the hybrid program and how we do it, I think the priorities have been set, which I agree with, which is number one, try to offer everybody that wants full day kindergarten, full day kindergarten. And then number, number two, try to keep as many people in the home school as we can. Now, how that is communicated, I, I'm not part of that. I don't know that we are. I mean, I think Mr. Bernard is usually very receptive to suggestions and so if you wanted to have a meeting and literally even look over the materials that are sent out or the emails I'm, I'm I'm suspecting he'd be perfectly happy because nobody wants to have people blindsided or confused or upset about something and so 
I mean, again, if somebody wants to take the time and you know meet and just say like, let's just go over this. But again, to me, there's two different issues. The one is the how, why the program is here, and why the program is here is to try to make sure that every student gets full day kindergarten. Because we, I was here when parents were very upset because they thought it was very important that their student would have full day kindergarten. And so I think it's the right choice to make sure that it's offered. Um, I think it's the right choice to then try to keep as many people you know, in district as we can, which again, I appreciate the flexibility um, because it, it looks at the overall you know, goals and the needs of the, of the district. Um, but again, how that's communicated, there's always ways to improve on that. And well, so- The third issue yeah. is the nuts and bolts of the curriculum being presented so that each kid in the hybrid class is getting the, the best benefit out of the curriculum. Yeah. But I'm assuming that they're doing that when the full class is there and that the half class is right. got, as you suggested, the playtime or the downtime or whatever, yeah. so that nobody's getting uh, shot changed on the curriculum. That's yeah, my my, old, my my oldest was in the hybrid the first year, or my middle one was the first year, and then you know, my daughter's impacted by next year as well. And so, again, I, I get it. I mean, I don't think absent full day kindergarten being mandatory, you know, more funds coming in, or I don't think it'd be redistricting. I think it'd almost be like a K through one school, a two, a three, and you know, four, that's, five. that's not going to work in a district like work. this. We've looked at it already. So, <clears throat> yeah. I, I will say, all of that said, no one's trying to shut off any creative ideas. I think that we've tried to put our heads together and come up with creative ideas, but to shut anybody off is a dumb thing to do. So if there are educators or parents who have ideas, we're more than welcome to hear them. I'm not gonna tell you that they're gonna be implemented, but um, if you shut everybody off, then you're just gonna keep doing the same thing, right? So um, if there are a bunch of parents that wanna get together, as I said, wanna have a meeting, I encourage it. I, I don't know what, looking at what we have, I don't know what the changes can be, but un unless we hear from parents and concerned residents, then we, you know, there'll be a few changes made. So I would say that not to discourage you from meeting with parents and to come up with ideas, it, but it, it, the whole th the constraining, the, while we always say it's what's best for the children, the constraining issues for us are um, enrollment and affordability. If we could afford to do an eight or nine half day class, we do it, but we can't afford it. Yeah, I just want to be careful that, you know, we also, we, we believe the hybrid model is effective too for right. children. I mean, I don't think we're, we're not doing this solely driven by the economic issue. I mean, if we didn't think it was no, we didn't do it until we researched other I, districts. I never would have brought it to the committee to uh, to begin with. Right, we researched other districts before we did it. It's. I think my experience tells me that it's a, a, a very common model in in districts very similar to ours where I live. I live in Rowley, the Triton district. That's all they have. But again. I've spoken to you once, Mrs. DeCarlo. I'm happy to follow up and have another conversation with you about it. Just let me know. I just want, can I thank you? Um, I mean, it is, it's a hot button issue, I think. And so I, since I'm hearing so much of it, I, I wanted to address it so that it could be, something productive could come of it. I don't mean to be saying that the communication is terrible and that parents should start overseeing it, Scott. So As, I, I, I don't start, you know, I'm not gonna start looking at Mr. Bernard's emails before he sends <laughs> But I think that it, it's, that isn't the issue. I think it's just that it's been going on for a couple of years now. I think from what I'm hearing as a parent, it's worth addressing to see how parents and teachers are, are finding it and if it's working and if, it, if everyone understands that that's what's gonna be happening next. Um, and to the, to the point where we, we started this, it, it is an issue that causes a lot of grief for, for you guys um, and for new parents and for parents choosing to come to North Reading or choosing private school for kindergarten. Um, I don't know, it hasn't so. caused me any grief. It <laughs> has me. I, with all due respect. Well, that's good. With all due respect, I, I mean it That's has good, I, I thought Mr. Webster right. was saying. It has caused. I, every time it comes up. Yes, it's, like, it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult issue. It is, yeah, sure. The one thing I will. I don't claim, I certainly don't claim. The one thing I'll say to you, you mentioned your marketing, I, my, I spent my whole career in marketing, and one of the things we both know, I can guarantee you that when we go to town meeting and the budget comes up there, we're gonna get questions from people. This budget's now been presented three times. It'll be presented at town, it will, it'll be presented a fourth time basically on the 30th. We've had two budget workshops. I can guarantee you that there's gonna be a lot of people saying, why isn't that teacher in the budget? Why, 
and it's like, you know, you tell them, tell them again, and then, you know, tell them again, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them again. And, but I, I hear what you're saying. So, again, any ideas? It's not that we're closing the door. I think the program's working, but we're not closing the door to hearing from parents. Okay. So, so I get some. And, and perhaps there's an opportunity to revisit the full day for all. As uh, we can. I, if the state, I mean, I think it's always worth revisiting that. We might get the same answer, but it's always worth revisiting. It was three years ago. We did it last, right? 2015. When we yeah. check with the, the state. The state situation is the same. I checked yeah, it every year. Okay. I think we're the better. The funding situation is not yeah. changing. Okay. So I think not, we're better spent putting our energies into something that we know we can achieve as yeah. opposed to something that's just never going to happen. I mean, if, that's some, happen. if that were something that the town valued, then maybe that is something that we go to an override for. Right. We want full day kindergarten. Right. That it would have to be an override. We would have to have an override, which means spend a lot more than the two right. and a half allows us to I spend. Think anything either in favor of that. I want it, but I'm saying if the town wants it, put it out there. And that would have to be a top priority in addition to. I would support it, but yeah. that's just me. I would vote for it, but I would. In the back there, could you please hand the mic, please? Thank you. Oh no. This is not first. This is not kindergarten. So thank you. Um, no. But I do have a kindergartner, so come coming in. So thank you, Erin um, McGaffigan, Picard Lane, or Pickard, depending on who I ask. <laughs> if you if you know, let me know. Um, but anyways, going back to the language conversation, I'm I do also value the language, and I res appreciate you bringing that up. I have noticed we were in Virginia for a couple years. We got kindergarten language, we got language from kindergarten twice a week. And I know that there are some local cities or towns that do offer it as early as kindergarten. Has, it sounds like it's, there's a long history there. Has there been any kind of going through all the weeds on any kind of supplemental grant related creative funding for this that we should know about or windows of opportunity we should be thinking about as we, grant writers? <laughs> we've definitely explored um, the grants at the kindergarten levels in uh, don't qualify um, for the grants at the moment, and we have looked at that on an annual basis. And actually, most of the kindergarten grants have almost been eliminated um, or reduced by the state over the last few years. So districts that were one time, you know, receiving funding for, for, for those grants um, have had to kind of scramble over the last few, few years given the loss of funding. Um, we, we've looked at, we brought, I don't know, if we, are we doing it this year or do we just do global it? Child. Global Child. We brought in the Global Child Program. Right. Now, the unfortunate thing with that is, you have students who are doing an, 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 a program that's affiliated with the school system, but it's not the school yeah, system's and, program. And I've done it, and it's just not even close to the, I mean, with all due respect, it's, no, it's, it's, not not, a real, it's not working it's for, for yeah, me as an individual right, family. Right, and you have to pay for it. Yeah. I was willing to pay for it, but it just wasn't the best bang for approach and buck. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a cultural thing about whether or not you even value language at an early age and and what it means, you know, where the research says. And so I'm just wondering if, so it sounds like the kindergarten thing has, or the funding is, is not there. Are there any, somebody that's not informed in this, are there any other creative thoughts that have been, is this, a, is, has every stone been unturned in this topic? I think. Foreign language? Yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look you in the eye and tell you that every stone. I appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> to, to so who would I work with and talk to about that specifically if I was interested in learning more? Mr. Venezia. No, no. <laughs> I, no, I, I do think, I think even with funding, it would be hard to sustain it. I mean, it's hard. It would. a lot of funding sources aren't permanent sources either, you know. Yeah. So we've, we've had it. It's been a goal of ours for years um, to try to improve the foreign language program. And it's a goal this year. It is. Uh, it's in our budget. It's in that budget, the, the third budget. And, and last is, year, it uh, was almost cut. Yeah. Right. We almost cut. We almost removed yeah. what yeah. we yeah. had, That's and that sad. was not okay. <laughs> so I think we all feel the same way, that the foreign language offerings from the middle school, well, certainly the middle school on up through the high school, are not adequate. Yeah. Uh, and it's the one area I think we're lacking in curriculum is yeah, foreign it's, language. I've been here 15 years, and it's probably come up every year. Yeah. When I was the high school principal, we introduced a German course one year. It ran for two years. We had to cut it. We introduced Mandarin. It never got funded. Never funded. I think it, it, the, the honest answer from my perspective is it becomes a priority game. And we, what, what bubbles up to the top, and unfortunately the foreign languages just haven't. I'll tell you, I like you, I'm a huge believer in it, 
but I've seen a societal drop off in interest in foreign language programs well, in I general. Guess that's the point I'm trying to make too. Well, I think exactly. We've and and seen that too with with the, kind of the emergence of STEM. Right. I think we've tried to supplement some of our cultural exposure for children through international travel, yeah. the introduction of the global child. I'm not at all suggesting that those are, um, you know, substitutions, but they're things that we've been able to do to provide an exposure to children that, um, you know, otherwise they would not be getting anything. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate, but I think the idea of the priorities, and I think the point about, you know, whether or not foreign language has, has taken, you know, for lack of a better way to say, maybe a little bit of a backseat to some other trends yeah. that are emerging now in, in the STEM world, digital learning, you know, I think that's, when I talk about priorities, I think that that, that has been the, you know, foreign language has sometimes become the unfortunate victim in the, um, in the prioritization of our, of our goals. Um, but the committee, to its credit, it's been on a long time. Um, it just, we just haven't been able to get there and we're, you know, you saw tonight what we're, where our priorities lie and we're trying to yeah. recognize affordability. It's just, it's unfortunate, but. So. Yeah, and that's why I asked about the every rock unturned. I, I uh, realize where it's yeah. going to be in the list and just wondering if, you know, if there's anything I could do even to help out even thinking creatively and strategically about options and ideas, I would. There you go. go no, I'll just say, I mean, we definitely are always have our, you know, eyes open and, and, and ears prompt to, to any type of state funding or, or a grant opportunity that may be out there to enhance programs. And we've <coughs> gone after some, some grants. You know, and Dr. Dr. Daly does a great job also of his team, you know, looking at what grants may be available for, for education, you know, curriculum wise or so forth. And, um, we haven't, I haven't heard of any, for, you know, in particular for foreign language. A lot of the grants that we do have pursuing because of the demographic data of, of North Reading and our student demographics, we just don't quite qualify for. And, and, yeah. Um, but it's not, I mean, we're not open, you know, open to new ideas and, and new research and continue to look, you know, on that every, every stone. Scott? I mean, I, it, my comment is just, I think, I think it is about priorities and deciding, like, what we're going to do instead of that. And... The example that I would use would be robotics. They talked about STEM, but in particular robotics, they started a group, they've now started a group, and it was just a parent that said, we want this, and we're gonna put it together, and they put a donation, and they got a group together who's been doing very well, and because of that, because there's this interest, we're now adding robotics classes at the, at the high school, and to me, that's kind of how it begins. If you get a group together that wants this and does this, and whether it's a club or something like that, and then they bring it in, and they say, look, it, we're." we have 20 kids that want this this year. I mean, th to me, that's where I would, if I was going about it, I would probably start that way and try to get a club that gets together that wants to do this and focuses on this or find some other way and then brings it in because that's where, where a lot of the STEM has come. It's, some of it's been from, you know, the state or, you know, educators out there saying this is what you should be doing, but some of it's also just interest from parents in forming clubs and groups that are working on things and then we see that and we say okay well we should support that and give them a class if it's even if it's just one class a year to do that i mean that that's I, my thought i'll say this for the small program we have it's extremely well run we have an extremely um energetic and vibrant passionate, passionate teacher who heads the language department she's constantly trying to get us to increase positions she believes in the um, value of learning a foreign language. And if you have ideas, uh, I mean, I don't know, these guys are all busy, but Patrick or Patrick Daly, our assistant superintendent, is probably, I mean, I'm sure Patrick could find an hour or half hour to sit down with you. Yeah. Right, Patrick? Am I putting you on the spot here? No. And, and, and talk to you about <laughs> the foreign language. I mean, he's a believer in foreign language too. Yeah. We've, we do fall prey to, you know, if, if we aren't, if we aren't up to par on digital learning and technology, we'll get killed. Yeah. And so it just, go ahead, Patrick. Well, I'll just say, I appreciate it. It's great about Thunderbox too. We, we, we do look at every grant that comes along. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't qualify for a lot of grants in the state because I say this all the time, the folks, we're not the highest um, quality grant writers. We're not the highest quality writers. We're not the highest quality writers. We're not the We're not the highest incomes, but we're one of the lowest poverty. And so we're, we're, we're actually like in the top five or ten in the state, the lowest poverty. Or they're getting huge influx from, from other from other places. But um, there are places, look, we definitely understand the value. 
now you're starting farmer in, in kindergarten, and so that's what we talked about. Um, and we, as mentioned before, we, we do have, you know, we can sit here now, we, we talk about STEM, robotics, we talk about foreign language, we talk about art, we talk about all those things. Each one has a priority. And the other, the other fact that comes into is just the amount of time in the day. So it's not enough time. So sometimes supplementing after school, as we do with Global Child, um, is, is, you know, is, is an alternative. To start some of those, to start that interest earlier, then get kids thinking that way. But yeah, I'm absolutely open to, to kids' ideas or, or ideas. If anyone hears of something that's out there that we can look at, we can definitely explore. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, back in front here again. So this is a staffing related question. Uh, first and foremost, for the high school. So for the high school headcount, um, I see here you note um, in the full documentation about the advanced placement programs. It seems as though there's been a, a wonderful dramatic increase in the number of courses offered. However, the data for the success factor seems to be lacking where it says that we're still at the bottom percentile of students who are passing these exams. So I think I'm, I'm wondering what are the measurements of success, if you will. I'm head of so HR, the yardstick. So no, kids take there's it. a good reason for that. Yeah. Most school districts limit what students can take AP courses. We don't believe that. We believe that every student who wants to challenge themselves and take an AP course, regardless of they're the 4.0 student or they're the 2.0 student, we allow those students to take that course. And our, our, our passing rates have improved Significantly, we've also received awards, haven't we? We have. I, I could speak to it a little bit from when I was the high school principal. So we, haven't, we, we adopted an open enrollment policy probably back in 2005, somewhere around that. Um, so there's basically, aside from a prerequisite course that a student might need to take um, an, an advanced placement course, there are no other restrictions. Um, we adopted the belief that if the student wanted to challenge him or herself at, that, at, at a rigorous level, that we would support them in doing that. They sign an advanced placement course contract. They're, they're mandated to take the test. So even a student who may be doing poorly but you know wanted to challenge themselves but struggles, we still mandate that they take the exam, the AP exam, at the end of the year. And, and I would like to think, with all due respect to the committee, those who have been around for a while, I think there was some convincing that had to go on back in the mid-2000s that that was a philosophical belief that I was advocating for, that we were not restricting students. If they felt that they could challenge themselves with the most rigorous courses that we offered, we were going to support them in doing that. And they had to take the test. And they have to take the exam. They have to say, when you sign up for the course, you own the course. You know, barring something that is, I, I can tell you in the, in the 11 years that I was the high school, Year. The teachers meet with the students in the year prior to them taking the course to lay out for them, look at if you are going to sign up for this course, this is what's going to be expected of you next year. So if you, you know, this is kind of get oriented with AP statistics now before you sign up in June and lock yourself in for next year. And we do that, you know, I think for the obvious reason is to you know, give as much information to the child as we can before they before they put themselves in a position where they might they might struggle. But I, I would be much more proud of the fact that, that in 2003, we had 87 exams administered, and right now we exceed 400. And if we had eight advanced placement courses offered at that time, we now have 17. And while it's true that our, our scores, and there is no real passing, but a qualifying score of a three, four, or five, if we're going to run a little bit afoul of a, of, a, of a percentage of students getting a qualifying score of a three, four, or five, by some students benefiting from being in a rigorous course that helps them when they go off to college, or just opens their eyes to the kind of experience that they're going to have very soon after they leave high school, I fall on that, on that side. I so think because of that, we, we suffer a little bit in the overall statistic, but I'm very proud of the kids that, that come here and sign up starting in their sophomore year, putting their toe in the water with an advanced placement course and getting the support of their school to help them do that. And that's a conscious choice we've made, too. And I think last year, we took two and a half times more tests than Wilmington did. And they have a 900 enrollment. We have an 800 enrollment. So we're, we're giving the opportunity to more and more students to take these tests. Patrick? A few years ago, I applied for a grant from Massachusetts Mass Science Initiative. It would have been about a $450,000 professional development grant. And I, 
thought sure we were going to get that supportive grant. And the, the one reason we did not get it was because our advanced placement program was already so robust with the number of courses that we had and the number of students we had participating in it. And we lost out on the grant opportunity, essentially because we were at a place where the grant would have helped you to get. And we were already there before, before they made the decision on whether or not we would get the grant funding. Patrick? So I guess I think if, if we measured success, it's the percentage of students taking the courses. I will tell you one thing, we need more teachers for the AP courses because class sizes are too high in some of the cases. Yeah, that was my other question is, will the staff, this you know one FTE go towards that, that pool, if you will? Well, it would be, it would, because it would be a- We right now believe it would be identified in the math science area. Right. Another, uh, another byproduct, I think, of our advanced placement program and exposing students to it is we've seen a significant Yes. Uh, over the last several years. And I think, <laughs> I'd like to think that because students are getting some you know, academic rigor that they might not otherwise have gotten if they were restricted from taking a high level course, that our SAT scores may not be what they are. But right now, we're ranking um, two and three in our peer communities in this year, but nine other communities. They were very good this year. And it's always great being in Mr. Bernard's office when the superintendent from Linfield calls and asks him how we're doing so well on the SATs. That was uh, that was a highlight day for 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 me. Anytime so we can beat Linfield, right? In anything, Linfield. right? Anybody else? Well, thank you all for coming. A um, little smaller audience than usual, but a much more active and involved audience, which is probably better, and we get more out of it. I appreciate everybody coming tonight. So, as I said, this is the budget we're working toward getting approved. We do expect more money from the special education circuit breaker. We don't know what's gonna happen with the town side. We'll have our finance planning team meeting and we'll have a final number there. Scott? I just have, I just have one comment too. I mean, it, it is a smaller group, but usually there's nobody here. And so it is nice when parents come. And I know sometimes we may seem dismissive of ideas and thoughts and- Really? Again, well, most of us are, most of us with the exception right. of one are actually open to ideas and suggestions and thoughts. And so, Really, I mean, like, again, sometimes we've heard it from five different people and we may be a little bit short in a response back here or there, but I think everybody here does want to hear what the concerns are, and sometimes the right, right forum's not on Facebook, you know, and so by all means, like, reach out. I mean, reach out to us. We, I mean, we have parents, we have students that have gone through the school. We are parents, you know, I mean, we want to know, and so if there is a lot of people that are interested in foreign language, it'd be good to know. If there are things, if there are things that are not being communicated well, we'd like to know that. And so I think most people want to improve. And so by all means, I hope you don't take tonight as like we've been dismissed or whatever or we haven't been heard. It's not that. I mean, people do want to hear from you. And, you know, I encourage you to come every week. And so there's two on. things. Jerry can't get text messages or emails on an abacus. So that's a big problem for him. The second thing is. Come every week, but don't talk about kindergarten again. Um, the, <laughs> until after I've left. The second thing is. <laughs> I know I've spoken with a parent in this group, communicated with a parent in this group recently, and I think I helped her out and put her in touch. She wants to do something with the district. I'm always open. You probably see me on Facebook. Sometimes I'm also a little bit short-tempered on Facebook, but I'm really just trying to educate the masses as well as I can. Um, if you're not my Facebook friend, send me a Facebook message. I accept them. Um, I tell people, Julie, we tell people when the meetings are, Scott's less active because I don't know why, but um, I'm accessible. Three makes it I've only probably got one year left though, so you got about one year left to access, access me. So, um, and I know that, you know, the new, <laughs> the new committee members coming in um, will probably be as accessible as we are, hopefully. I see them here tonight. Um, hopefully they both get a lot. I don't, they don't have we'll much competition, right running. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they're on their way tomorrow morning to take their name off the ballot. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, you know, we are an accessible committee. I get back to everybody who contacts me, everybody, unless I don't see your message somehow. Um, but I usually do see them. So, so at this point we will close the public hearing and I thank you all for coming. And then on the 30th of April, we will make a vote on the budget.
And we'll move to back to our agenda of continued business. Mr. Bernard, we have an MS. We have a, actually have a secondary school building committee update, don't we? No, I do not. Well, we have a meeting. May first. Right. Yes. Um, Okay. Next, we have school committee policies, second reading. These are riveting. I don't know how any of you can leave for second readings of policies, but uh, anyway. Uh, first one is inoculations of students. This is just a revision to our existing policy. Uh, are there any questions or comments on this for a second reading? I know one of the, expecting one of the uh, Subcommittee members to well, Mr. Venezio, like go ahead. taking over last go last ahead. time. I go ahead. ahead. Uh, I don't even want to talk. <laughs> uh, I move for a second. Or again, just a quick. This is the update of the MASC policies. Um, I move for to accept for a second reading inoculations of students, section JGCC under section students. Basically, it's the same policy we had with some minor updates as suggested by the no, Mass. This is, a, this is the additional one because we didn't have anything. Yeah. Oh, we had we, we didn't we had it in our we had no we didn't have a policy we had it in our have this policy we had in our student handbook but not in the policy correct. correct I said second reading so we have a motion by Scott second by Janine to approve policy for a second reading policy J G C C inoculations of students and inoculations has one N that's correct you know what that looks so it's weird you say that it did to me too and we I had Ann check it just didn't look right to me but it's one end it's yeah. just like millennial millennials has two L's and two ends I can't get yeah. used to that either. I think it, it still doesn't look right to me no aye. so we have a motion a second any further discussion hearing none all in favor aye, aye. opposed unanimous okay administering Next. medicine to students I forget was this a this was a change this, or is, this, a, was this is an update correct revised right. and updated yeah revised and updated um, and so I move for a second to accept a second reading of policy JGCD entitled Administering Medicines to Students under Section Students. Second. Motion by Scott, seconded by Janine. Any Mr. further Mr. discussion? Webster, yes. Can I just ask something of the committee? Yes. I think this is the appropriate time to ask it now. We're under discussion. There's a provision in here that would allow for non medical staff to be trained, and it's subject to a vote of the committee. That's the, for the Narcan? Yes. In addition to the nurses being trained, I would also like to identify some key administrators to be trained. So I don't know if you want to make that as a second motion yes. outside of the adoption of the policy. Second, yeah. But before you moved on to the next one, I wanted to raise. Should that. mention that the, the um, so that should be a first reading and not a second reading or a second. No, or that's not a no. That's policy. nothing. You can do, that's a, a, you can do a vote after okay. the policy. I, I will say that uh, the yeah. the one major change in here is to um, allow. Um, school physicians and school nurse leaders and others who are trained to administer Narcan Correct. to any students who are or students or staff or anybody in the building who is suffering from an overdose. That's correct. And that's a key provision of this revised policy. Right. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. And at this time, before we go to the next policy. But do we have to post that first before we can vote on it or not? That's my concern. Yeah. No, it's it's part no, of just like a new topic. That no, it's part of our policy agenda. discussion. It wasn't on the original agenda. Right, but it's part of it's part of the policy discussion. Okay. Yeah, it's in. I would think it's in the policy. Think. I'm just asking. So I would think we can. Now, now we're just saying who's we're what gonna, administrators we're gonna, we're gonna are. We're going to give him approval. I would like you to right. train. authorize me to be able to right. identify right. other administrators. Okay. Right. Right. As the policy asks. So at this point, I will entertain a motion to give permission to mm -hmm. the administration. To, to, Mr. to Superintendent Bernard to train uh, non-medical non -medical staff correct. in the school system to administer Narcan. So moved. Second. And Mr. Chairman, the basis for that request, so I'm working with our police chief who is working with me with the district attorney's office to, we hope, um, obtain the Narcan. We think we can obtain the Narcan availability free of charge either through the district attorney's office or the drug free communities grant and we've discovered that the training is very simple it's almost like an, a kind of an EpiPen style yeah. um, training so it's not something that's you know very it's almost like the good samaritan rule comes into play too there's nothing that negative that can happen from this so we thought it would be wise to have <clears throat> more than one person in a school 
say the school nurse train if that person's not in we'd like to have a backup for so that. I, guess, I guess the only question I have here is is there any kind of liability in other words even if people are trained if I, I don't because I'm, I'm not familiar with what can happen I'm not going to say no because I think there is an you know the administration well there is probably with an epi pen too right exactly yeah okay right. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> same thing okay but I think I think with that you balance liability versus saving a life potentially. exactly right so we have a motion to second to enable Superintendent Bernard to train non-medical personnel in the administration of Narcan. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Next, Aye. the Athletic Fees and Co-op. Scott? Wait, is it, do we have communicable, communicable diseases yeah. first? Oh, is this a mine new are out of order. Communicable diseases is a new policy. It's a new one, yes, that's what I thought. Um, so communicable diseases is another new policy that we didn't have. The MESC suggested that we agreed to put before everyone, so I move to accept for a second reading policy JGCF entitled Communicable Diseases Under Section Students. Second. And again, this was in our handbooks regarding students who should or shouldn't come to school if they're Correct. sick, ill, communicable. Codifying now, right, now we're codifying it into right. the policies. So we have a motion and a second to approve second reading policy JGCF communicable diseases. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed, unanimous. Scott? Yep. And I move for a second reading policy JHAF entitled Athletic Fees and Co op Teams under Section Students. This is just revised policy, which specifically addressed to the co op right. uh, fees. I'll second. And motion to second. Quick explanation. This is to um, codify or put in the policy that all co-op teams uh, participants will pay the North Reading fee that they owe and then will play on the co-op team. Yeah. And in the past it could have, it would have, if the fee charged to the school was higher than the North Reading fee, they would have had to pay the higher fee up to the family cap. Correct. So we have a motion and a second for second reading policy, JHAF, athletic fees and co-op teams. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, unanimous. Um, and then the last one is, again, this was just some modified language suggested by, the, by our council. And so I move for, to accept for a second reading, policy JRE entitled non-custodial parents' rights under the section entitled students. Second. And just quickly, this one is when non-custodial parents and when they can't uh, obtain records from the school department. So only applies to custodians? Yes, only custodians. <laughs> so we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Come in and see that one. The superintendent, uh, excuse me, yes. So we've got the policies, budget, superintendent's evaluation, formative assessment, one of my favorite terms, formative assessment. Thank you to the state for that term. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I think tonight, I just wanted to introduce to you a couple of things that are in your packet. The first is, um, so this is my mid-cycle um, update to all of you. Um, what's noted in the column to the right in the green is where I think things are in relation to the goals that I had set forth um, in my educator plan back last May. Um, so I have eight goals. The, um, they're in the yellow, um, the, the professional practice goal, the student learning goal, and then six district improvement goals. So I, I think you've, seen, you've all seen that document before. It's just the information's new, but the formatting, I think, is the same. What's, what's a little bit different is the, the, um, the process for the formative assessment. So the second document that I've given to you contains a lot of the same information as the first, although it's in the, um, the template that the Department of Education has issued for this process. And so what I've done is, earlier today, I emailed it to all of you. If you wanted to go in and use this, it's a fillable form. And so the, the color of the goal and the section where you would fill in the feedback match. So for, for example, on page one, my professional practice goal has the green bar. Below the green bar on that same page is where the feedback for that goal would go. And then it just goes throughout the document in those, in those for the eight goals. So what I'm hoping you, you can do between now and April 30th is, um, is to, to take a look at where um, I've given you feedback on where I think things stand with relation to my eight goals 
and, and provide me with some feedback on them as I have the next year now to kind of bring the plan to completion. So it would be, it would be this time next year that the two-year cycle would end. And this, I, this feedback goes back to you directly, not to one so of us to what I So what I thought would happen is if you gave them to me on the, on the 30th, I would take the data, compile it into one form. I know in the past, I didn't want to presume that Mrs. Kofke would do it. You've done it in the past, but. No, I was going to do it. Were you? Okay. So okay. they can go to Ms. Imbriano, and then on May 7th, again, this would be the committee, this committee would still be intact, which I think was a goal originally when I, mm -hmm. remember I was off cycle because I had started in October. I got back on kind of the cycle where um, I would be evaluated before um, the election. So I think that would, that would accomplish things if, if we could talk about this on, at the May 7th meeting. So I guess my question is, it, so then we would discuss it in public after? I think you could discuss 30th, it in I think May 7th? Could, correct. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I think makes sense. All right. um, there's, no, there's no rating that takes place this year. It's more just, you know, you think things, I've indicated that I think I'm on target with the eight goals, disagree. but you might, you might feel differently. And if you do, I, I certainly would welcome that feedback. Yeah. I'll give you an A if you fill us out for me. <laughs> So just so just, I already did. Just you don't, you don't have question. grids on So the one that you sent to us today does not have the boxes filled in. It does. This is it does. It does. It does have the boxes okay. filled in too. Yeah. Are you, you. Yeah. Okay. He's just. You're filling in. We're just right. looking for comments at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking. Right. I'm looking okay. for you to feedback. Provide okay. feedback in the bottom. Just, okay. This is all for you now. I've kind of <laughs> given you where I, my yep. feedback on where things are, but it's for you to okay. comment here. On, on how you think I'm doing with respect to that goal. That eight eight times. Room, yeah. you're, you're missing. It, it if you type it in, it expands. Yeah, that's not this I would just, not limited to I that. would just say, as Jerry, the Jerry chairman, it would have been nice for the rest of the members to follow my example and already have their assignment completed. Well, it's not due. I know, but mine's done. Well, I started it. In, we can put in more time yeah. on it. Probably. Now I've got 20. The last thing I wanted to yeah. mention. John, John, yes, Mr. Brad. The box is on the last one, by the way. You just mark it on target. I know. <laughs> the, the other I provided to you tonight in, as part of my superintendent's report, just kind of some additional information for you to consider. I gave you kind of a little bit of an overview of my self-assessment. Okay. I'm sorry it's a little bit wordy. You know how I get sometimes when I start writing, so I apologize. But I thought it was important to just capture some things that, that have been going on as it relates to the kind of the four standards of the rubric. And hopefully that might give you a little bit more um, evidence of how I'm doing with respect to the goals and maybe some other things too. So you can use that if you want for some. We got to get this meeting over because I am reading this right when I get home. Huh. Rest of the committee should also. When it's fresh in your mind. Mr. Bernard, you. it's fresh in your mind. I'll just Thank read your posting on Facebook. I'm going Thank you. home and think about different kindergarten options. Oh, Jesus. You're, 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 That'll be my right, first I'm, objective. Good thing he's leaving. Well, it's good. There'd be a mutiny. I <laughs> well, I, I proposed the override, so. Yeah. Well, I would support you. Did. I like tell you something. Okay, next. Minutes. I, 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 have, I am all over the place. We have an executive session. <laughs> you're, you're right. You're on target. Yeah, we have an executive March session. Yep. For March 12th, 2018. Could I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve minutes from March 12th, 2018, executive session. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. And then we have the regular session for March 12, 2018. Make a motion to approve March 12, 2018 regular session meeting minutes. Second. Motion to second to approve regular session. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Okay. And, okay. Budget update. We are. I think we have. We've heard enough from you tonight, yeah, Mr. Conley. It will be an FY18 at the next meeting, though, as well. Okay. Staffing. No changes to report, Mr. Bernard. That's correct, sir. Bids and donations. Can I read them tonight? Would you like to? Yeah. Oh, sure. I'm in the mood to read tonight. I. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the mood to read what? I don't think I can register these without Julie reading them. It's become kind of a. All right. All right. I'll, I okay. will do them. No, no. <laughs> Miss Kopke? No, Miss Kopke? Okay. Yeah. Not many left, so. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $25 from Anthony and Deborah Maffio to support the North Reading High School track team. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Yes. Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $50 from Michelle and George O'Connor to offset the costs associated with the eighth grade Washington, D.C. trip. Mm. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of 39 ferry tickets valued at $546 for the boys lacrosse team to travel to Nantucket for games on Saturday, April 7th, 2018. That's really cool. Second. Motion second. It's a shame they lost the game. Nantucket's very good this year. It was a hard fought game, 15 to 11, I think. Oh, really? we, we lost. But Nantucket looks like one of the top teams in Division Three, so we have them back up here toward the end of the season. There's some warm down there. So we have a motion discussion. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $600 from Mr. Joseph Zarnada to support expenses associated with the girls' tennis team at the high school. Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of 12 26-inch flat-screen TVs valued at $1,200 to be used by the North Reading, Public, North Reading Public Schools Technology Department for staff training and classroom educational use, and that was from Centennia Systems, Inc. Second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $2,661.75 from the Hood Elementary School Parents Association to support expenses associated with the fifth grade duck boat field trip. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $2,897.50 from the North Reading High School lacrosse boosters to support the girls lacrosse team at the high school. Second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Again, thank you very much to boosters and community members for continuing to support the school system. I think next year, Mel. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I would. Uh, I think that should be your position next year, reading the I, reading the donation. I like to read, so. There we go. I like to read aloud. I like to hear myself. You bring Julie back as a guest reader. For the <laughs> <laughs> okay. She has to come every week. Next, it looks like we have subcommittee updates. And first subcommittee update is athletic subcommittee. We met on March 27th. We got a report from athletic director Dave Johnson on the number of participants. We have approximately the same number of participants we had last year. It's down a few. We have 334 students participating in spring sports, about 45%, maybe a little less of the uh, entire high school class participating in spring sports. We also discussed the uh, athletic budget. We're going to close out with a small, um, a small. Well, we actually gain. Pay, there's a payback, though. So. Yeah, we, right. we actually have gotten very right good news today. that that will be paid back by the end of the fiscal year. I saw it. they've raised nineteen thousand yeah. dollars. The baseball team. That revenue came in today. Right. So we, we should end up with about sixteen thousand. Right. So we'll have a, sixteen to seventeen thousand. A little more. Yeah. yeah. We will have about sixteen thousand as a balance at the end of the school year, which is always important because we don't know sometimes with the fees how much we're going to get the following year. So. Right. Yep. That will be we'll have a balance there. Um, you know, I'm a little bit disappointed in this. The, uh, I'm excited that we're finally going to have a restroom facility and a permanent uh, snack shack, but it's taking forever for them to complete the project down there, and I, I am a little bit disappointed. I communicated with Mr. Bernard today, and he's doing all he can to uh, working with the designer and the contractor to get this thing done, but they said four or five days after it was delivered. It's been here since March 20th, I believe, or maybe even earlier. It's a couple of weeks since the delivery. We had about 12, 13 days. They did run a little snag with the with the right. up, but I mean, but I do think it's been slower than we anticipated. Well, it's not costing us anything. Though. No, so, but, uh, it, I, but it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient, Jerry. We have is, varsity games going on down there, and we I, have one porta potty. Thanks to Marty's Marty Tilton had foresight to bring a porta potty in. How close are they, Jerry? So I went down today after the meeting. I had a meeting at town hall this morning. When I came back in uh, to my office, I drove over and. I'd like to think that next Tuesday is the date to pave, but I, I, you know, I thought it would have been paved by now. 
But so the paving, the, I mean, is the place ready to use? No, it? no, it's not. The so electricity the wasn't turned on yet. The information I got this morning at my meeting was the RMLD I knew had been there on uh, Friday. Right. To do a sh they had to do a shutoff and then a tie-in, and they were supposed to be back today. I haven't heard any more since, what was that, 10 o'clock? Yeah. Yeah, community at 1030. Um, but the, they were anticipating the electric hookup today, the, which would then allow for you know, the system to work. They were going to do the, the pump testing and all uh, tomorrow. They were going to be doing a lot of grading tomorrow, loan delivery tomorrow and Wednesday. He had hoped that they were going to schedule the pavement for Thursday or Friday, but the first time they get the asphalt plant open and asphalt available is next Tuesday. So I'd say, is that, am I right, Mr. Webster? That's yes. about all of it. Right. It's, so it's still a week. But I, I wanted the site cleaned up just because we have a game tomorrow. The baseball, I mean, be have they fixed down the th first baseline there? I mean, right? No, not to the level that it needs to be. That's a big I spoke concern. With the, I spoke with the athletic director in the baseball. I think we'll be okay for tomorrow. Our people are going to be down there tomorrow. I've asked okay. how to have our facilities people down there tomorrow. There's a lot of sprucing up that needs to take place. Yes. I, I in my mind, I think we're probably a good 14, 15 days behind where I thought we would be. Agreed. You know, if we had been on the target I, date, I think we should have been on, we would have been great. I mean, the well, weather was the snow. We had the weather the snow, was an issue. It was. Yeah, snow. but there, since we've since that building has come been put there, yeah. they've taken way too long, and I expressed that today yeah, in I an email. I don't disagree. Reply. I, I, I expected a little bit more the end of last week, so. Yeah, I did too. But I'm hoping, you know, I didn't go down there to light a fire anybody, under anybody. No. I was asking pointed questions, like, you know, we've got things starting this week. We need to, The funny know. part is that there were guys down there working every day. There we are. had two varsity lacrosse <laughs> games last week, yeah. and, you know, it. I mean, just, to its credit, the facility is beautiful. Right. I mean, it's gonna be great. It is, it's great. It's, it's a nice building, but it's, I just, need, it needs to be operational. So I'm working on it. I mean, I certainly, if things come, that I think you need to know, I'll tell you. But. The other thing is, because of the delay in getting that finished, that's delayed the construction of the softball, baseball, batting cages down there. Yes, which I did authorize to stop moving forward move forward? Tomorrow. Okay. I felt like I had gotten enough of an assurance of the laboratory project that I um, authorized Eric Archambault today to, and Dave Johnson that they could start moving forward. And those are all being built, those are being built with non-budget funds. That's coming from the community donations. Two, two batting cages, that's right. correct. No, no budgetary funds. Right. And uh, that's about it. We talked about the co-op team policy and fields uh, facilities maintenance. We had some discussion about the fields being ready and not ready for certain activities right. too. Yeah. Right. Next, uh, Scott, anything from NorCam? No, I mean, I, I attended the meeting, but. They're just basically going through their contract negotiations right now. That was the main thing. Okay. And then the Athletic Facilities Committee was basically the same. What we did actually, we approved at the Athletic Facilities Committee, um, and is to, we're going to pave a, a, a small roadway that comes down from the parking lot to the restroom and um, uh, concession stand facility for deliveries, for maintenance, et cetera. There's already a, a walkway there, so they're basically just expanding uh, well, it's going to be next to the this walkway. Pave is there right, right. Now, so it's going to go down beside the pavement. Right, it'll be, it'll be down. To, it'll be a side of the walkway, and that'll be part of the project when it's complete. That's that's my understanding. And then finally, finance planning team. Basically, everything we talked about in the budget. There's really um, nothing else from so that. They gave us the revenue plan. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, administrative report. Anything, Mr. Bernard? Let's see. So, Mr. Chairman, I had two things, one of which I already spoke about, and that was kind of the self-assessment that I had given to you re as it relates to my annual evaluation. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I do want to just mention briefly, and it was talked about a little bit at the, um, at the beginning of the meeting when Michael Tyrell did his student report, was Parent University on Saturday. Um, I, I'm really pleased with, um, with, with, with how the day went. I'm very grateful. This was, you know, a volunteer effort. Um, we had a, a very good number of staff from elementary, middle, and high school. Um, in attendance, making uh, presentations to, I would say about 100 people in attendance um, on, on Saturday from roughly 8 to 12.30. Um, we had six sponsors that, um, that, that funded the event. There was no, um, no taxpayer money, no, no budgetary uh, contributions um, to the day. It just, it went really well. Um, the feedback I got, from staff and, and those in attendance was all positive. Um, Mr. Webster was kind enough to let me know that there was some social media 
feedback on, on the weekend, which was nice to hear. Um, we will be administering a survey this week to people that attended just to kind of ask them um, what they thought what they liked, what might we be able to approve upon? Because quite honestly, I'd like to, and my notes reflected here to you tonight, but I'd like to, I'd like to continue, continue to do this annually. So I've kind of tentatively set a date of April 6th, 2019, which will be kind of the, I guess we'll go with the first Saturday in April. Um, pretty safe with the snow, you know, no snow, leads into the vacation week, so. Um, but it was really good, and I'm just, you know, it, you can't help as the superintendent but feel really proud about people willing to give up their Saturday to come in here and just really talk with such passion about, you know, something that was exciting them and they wanted to share with parents. It was great. And, uh, and we had the information pavilion on Main Street. You know, Scott and, and Janine were there. Um, and I thought that was a nice idea. It was, a, you know, people were able to hit that for about 20 minutes in between each workshop. We had the public librarian, children's librarian here with our library staff. Um, the robotics, first robotics students and their advisor were here. It was really, it was neat. We had a lot of, about maybe nine or so presentations, some refreshments. It was just, I think it was one of those good feel good days for, for North Reading. So, Congratulations. I thought you'd appreciate it. Yes, great idea. Oh, thank you. It was, it was truly a team effort, so thank you. Scott? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just uh, echo what you just said, but I mean, it, it, was, it was fantastic. I mean, I think your leadership on it was great and it was, it was better than I expected. Um, I didn't know what to expect really, but mm -hmm. like it was really engaging. And, and when I went to register, there were a lot of programs that I thought were good. And what I really liked about it was that it did in, it did hit all different grade levels. And so I heard a lot of elementary parents saying, oh, this is our first time we've been in the school, oh. you know? And so yeah. it was their first time to yeah. be, be able to get in here and walk around. And mm -hmm. you know, it was good. It, it, was a, it was a well run program. And I mean, everybody, the, everyone that I went to, the, the funniest was the, math anxiety one that I went to and I got yelled at by the teacher in one of them. Oh, great. <laughs> you go into something about math anxiety and then they make it worse. Because <laughs> we, 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 had, we had partners and then she came over, she was talking, she asked a question and I thought it was to both of us, but it was apparently to my partner and she, uh, she scolded me for answering. And what a shock, huh, Jerry? I'm surprised you don't get yelled at more often. <laughs> I really am. Oh. It, it does. It, 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 from everything I've heard, John, it was a great success. So yeah, thank you and the, the staff and the, the volunteer their time and the, the community and businesses that donated yeah. to help make it possible. It's a great event. Thank you. Yes. So they took that upon themselves because I know that there's been discussions in the past about the, the way little it was, school program. Uh, the way it was created, it was done through after school enrichment. So my daughter was able to participate starting in September all through the school year. Great. And before we move to correspondence, which I know there's none of, I did not read the subcommittee schedule. The evaluation subcommittee is meeting April 11th at 3 p.m. Finance planning team is meeting April 26th at 8 a.m. NORCAM board, 7 p.m. on April 26th. Policy subcommittee, my favorite committee because they meet at 7 a.m. on April 27th. And, your favorite people. and I will never, ever be on that committee. <laughs> and then the athletic subcommittee will be meeting May 1st at 12.30 p.m. Six days before Mr. Venezia's last meeting if he isn't run out of town on a rail. Um, administrative report. And no correspondence, John. You gave your administrative report. Cool. Correspondence, future business. April 25th, we will be meeting with the Finance Committee. It's not a requirement that everybody attends, but right. it, it is an informative meeting because you get to hear the questions that the Finance Committee is asking. Is it open to the public? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a regular Finance town Committee town meeting. Yeah, yeah, it's at Town Hall. Then on April 27th, we have our budget workshop yeah. at 3 p.m. One thing on April 27th. Are we going to be done by 7 p.m.? It's a father-daughter dance. If we're not done by 7 p.m., oh. that, that, this won't be my last year in the school. Yeah. It'll be my last day. Yeah. Good. 
audience too. Six p.m. because father daughter dance. To go to. We'll be done. We'll be done by then. Uh, April thirtieth, six thirty, a regular meeting where we will take a vote on the budget. Uh, then May seventh, six p.m. Distance learning lab at North Reading Middle High School here. And the reason why we're starting early is we want to celebrate the. No, we shouldn't say celebrate the departure. We want to mark the departure of Mr. Celebrate Venezia and Ms. Kopke from the school committee. That's why we're having a meeting on the 7th? No, we're meeting early. Oh, meeting we have a meeting, but we're meeting early so we can go out and... That sounds like a plan. If you know what I mean, go out and mark your departures. <laughs> the election May 8th, then? Is that what it is? Yes, the election is May 8th. Remember to vote. <laughs> With that, anybody else have anything else? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Um, does anybody want to stay late to talk about this kindergarten thing? No. <laughs> no. I will. Come on. <laughs> Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Move, motion by Julie, second by Janine. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Thank you. <laughs>